Okay, we will begin in about a minute. Good morning. The March meeting of the Kansas State Board of Education is called together, called to order. As is obvious, we're meeting in person today, uh, but we are being live streamed on YouTube so that the public may observe. I'd like to welcome everybody uh, that is following online. And for the first time in months, for the first time in months, I would also like to recognize, or like to welcome those of you who are actually here in person, uh, uh, properly social distance. We thank you for being here today. I want to acknowledge that all board members are present and the mission statement of the Kansas State Board of Education is, to, is for the Kansas State Board of Education to prepare students for lifelong success through rigorous quality academic instruction, career training, and character development according to each student's gifts and talents. Our revision is for Kansas to lead the world in the success of each student. At this time, we will pause for a moment of silence. Now, if you'll please stand with me and join as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. As we move to the agenda, item 16 on our agenda is the approval of a uh, charter application that has been uh, uh, rescinded. However, we'll leave that on the agenda and the reasons for that will be explained at that time. And another, just not a, it's not a change in the agenda, but a change in the order. And that is that we always have a legislative report uh, from, uh, from Craig and then later on during the committee reports, we have a legislative uh, report from our liaisons. I would ask that the legislative liaisons be prepared to report at the same time and we'll follow up Craig instead of so we don't have to do that. Basically, we do the same thing twice. And so we can do that together. And from this point on, uh, the legislative liaison will be part of the legislative report. If there are no Additions to the uh, agenda. A motion would be in order to approve the agenda. Ben and Dina. All in favor, please raise your hand. I see a 10 and 0. Thank you very much. There are two sets of minutes. Uh, the first one, uh, are there any corrections to the first one for February the 9th and 10th? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of February 9th and 10th? Ann makes that motion. Jean seconds that motion. 
All in favor, please raise your hand. That's a 10 0 vote. Thank you very much. There was also a special board meeting on February the 22nd. Are there any corrections or additions to these minutes? If not, a motion would be in order to approve. Melanie, a motion, second. Dina seconds the motion. All in favor, please raise your hand. It looks like that's a, again a 10 0 vote. The next uh, uh, item on the agenda is the opportunity we have to recognize uh, uh, two uh, national winners. And Tate, if you'll come forward, please, and uh, introduce our guest and uh, explain the uh, honors. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am Tate Tateman. I'm on the Special Education Title Program Services team. And one of my roles on the team is to work with our Title I buildings across the state. And each year I'm honored to be here as we've selected two schools that we've recommended nationally to our ESEA network, which stands for the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, to receive the Distinguished School Award. This year across the nation there were 57 schools that were awarded the Distinguished Schools. And so today we have with us from Gary County USD 475 Sheridan Elementary. Their principal and superintendent will be joining us via Zoom. And then with us in person today is Chitopa Elementary. Their principal and superintendent will be joining us in person. So the two awards that go out to buildings that are served with any title programs, so that could be Title I, Title II, three or four, which are all part of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And we base it on our state assessment scores. So for this year, we are using the last three sets of scores that we have since we did not have any last year. And so we're gonna present these two schools. We're gonna let them talk about all their successes and then their experience at our national conference, which was last month. It was 100% virtual, and so we'll let them explain kind of their conference experience, and then we'll take any questions that board members may have for our schools. So I'd first like to introduce online for category one, which is exceptional student performance for two or more consecutive years, and that is Sheridan Elementary School in Junction City in Gary County School District. And I'm going to turn this over to Dorothy Coleman and Reginald Eggleston to share with you. Well, first, let me say good morning to everyone and thank you so much uh, for this recognition. Uh, I want to say how proud I am of Sheridan Elementary and how much I appreciate the leadership uh, that Ms. Coleman provides. Uh, the school as well as in the community. Sheridan is very well respected in our community. Uh, Ms. Coleman is well respected by principals across the district. Uh, she does an outstanding job of advocating for young people and supporting her teachers. Um, here recently, I had an opportunity to sit in on a faculty meeting and just observe. And it's amazing uh, when you feel and see the energy that comes across uh, from the teachers as they demonstrate their passion for helping young people uh, go above and beyond. Uh, many, uh, many times, uh, many times it goes against what they even believe about themselves. And so I am just so honored and so humbled that we have been uh, offered this opportunity. Uh, and so I'm just going to turn it over to Ms. Coleman and let her have some words. But again, I just want to say how proud uh, the Board of Education here as well as the entire district is of Sheridan Elementary, and again, how much we appreciate the leadership of Ms. Coleman. Thank you, Dr. Eggleston, and just congratulations to Chitopa Elementary School as well for uh, their award. Thank you to the State Board for allowing us to come today and share all the positive hard work that our staff and students are engaged in each and every day. Um, the conference that we went to was, even though it was virtual, we gained so much from that. My entire team uh, was able to join. And since that time, we have infused um, 
different uh, sessions that we went to, we are infusing into our Wednesday after school meetings and our building in service meetings. Um, this school has always um, just shined in the areas of academics and behavior expectations. Uh, we support the five state board goal areas with our kids first mindset. And that's evident in our conversations um, in the building and across the district. Our culture is constantly nurtured and recognized in our weekly meetings, in teacher reflections. Um, once a month, we have um, whole staff meetings where our classified and certified staff get together. And we do uh, PD. I shared um, one of the speakers, um, a huge speaker, um, Hill, Mr. Hill. Um, he uh, just was inspiring to all of us with, as we enter into some conversations about equity and diversity. Uh, furthermore, when we implement the Safe and Civil Schools program, that helped us develop a framework um, that has also increased our academic and behavioral successes within the school. And we enjoy great support from our district administration and our local board of education. I think our success comes from the fact that we focus on what matters most, that's people and relationships, professional development, and instructional time. Uh, time is our most precious commodity and we use it wisely and effectively. Um, meetings and requirements are always well organized, focused, agenda driven, and every teacher and student knows the expectations for each and every day that they're here. Our instructional coach has been instrumental in maintaining the culture and climate while we welcome new staff members each year. And it's just a great place to be. It's warm, it's welcoming, and um, we enjoy working with our community on many levels. So thank you again for allowing us to come today and to honor us with this um, award. And we just look forward to what's to come. I would like to say thank you to the State Board of Education and Dr. Watson for your leadership and support uh, throughout this pandemic. There have been so many changes and different um, just responses that have been needed, uh, but we do appreciate uh, all that you do in order to ensure that we are tooled and equipped uh, and ready to just to respond in the most appropriate way and that we can continue to serve our young people. So thank you uh, for your leadership as well. Thank you, Ms. Coleman and Dr. Eggleston. And our next school that we're honoring today is from second category, which is closing. Any comments or questions uh, to the uh, uh, people from Sheridan Elementary? Betty. Were there any particular challenges that your school's been faced with? In the past year or in the past few years, I can. The past um, two. Well, I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit of background about the district itself. With us having 52% of our students being associated with the military, we find ourselves having uh, some transition, whether it's with staff or with students on an annual basis. And I think a challenge is trying to keep a high level of academic emphasis even when you have that level of movement when it comes to personnel and students. Our district averages anywhere between 89 to 119 new personnel on an annual basis. That impacts every school, specifically Sheridan. And so being able to bring new personnel in, get them acclimated to the expectations as well as help young people rise to the new level of academic challenge, I think is something that Sheridan Elementary School has done very well. Another challenge I'll speak to is um, kindergarten readiness. One of the board goals, we are lucky this year to have our first early childhood classroom in our building. Uh, prior to that, we, we are, we're seeing some struggles with kin, uh, kids entering kindergarten, not really quite ready yet in some areas. And what I've watched this year in that early childhood classroom 
has just made my heart sore because I know that those kids are going to be more than ready as they enter kindergarten next year. So that's exciting to see and a challenge that we're meeting head on. So thank you for the question. Well, may I offer my congratulations. <laughs> thank you. And on behalf of my colleagues on the State Board of Education, we uh, want to congratulate you. I'm not. Mr. Porter, I just want to you. say to the guests, thank you. we have a shared and all-star in the room. So I know how you would like to recognize <laughs> your, your hometown and your home schools and so on and so high. It's a shared and all-star. So. That's right. <laughs> thank you. Anyway, I would, on behalf of the board, I want to thank you for the great job that you're doing. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see you back next year uh, for the same reason. Uh, we, we, always, we always like repeats uh, because that shows a consistent uh, uh, progress forward. And exceptional student performance is a great thing. And we know that that does not happen without leadership uh, and cooperation and collaboration. And I'm sure that those are areas where you'll work very well. And we appreciate that. We, we appre that. But, but the benefit is for the students that are in your class that are in your classrooms because they're the ones that are going to benefit from your opportunity, these opportunities. Ben. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd like to echo uh, the chairman's comments uh, representing portions of Geary County. Uh, I have a lot of downtown Junction City. I share with Dr. Horst, who shares the base and the outskirts of the town. Um, I'm very proud, and I believe you were the site of a K-Toy teacher uh, last year as well in your building, and so Dean and, have, uh, and I have had the opportunity to, to visit Sheridan Elementary, uh, pre-COVID, of course. Uh, I believe it was the previous year, and so we got to see the work close hand of what happens in Sheridan Elementary. I'm very proud of the work uh, that is done there. That's right. We've actually had two K-Toy teachers um, in a row, two years in a row, um, our music teacher, um, did not get to receive that last year, and I think that is happening um, coming up this uh, in a weekend or so here. So we're excited. We are growing great teachers, and our partnership with Kansas State University helps to continue that infusion of, of new and, and energetic young teachers coming into our district. So we have nothing but exciting things ahead for us. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And we usually... We usually take pictures uh, with uh, with your with, with uh, the people, the board members that represent you. I don't know how we're going to pull that off. We may have to send them to your district someday to uh, to take that picture. But uh, we look forward uh, to seeing you again. Thank you very much. Okay, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you again, Miss Coleman and Dr. Eggleston. Our next category is the closing the achievement gap between student groups. And when we look at the different student groups, we're talking about our free lunch versus non-free lunch students in our districts. And this year's winner was Chatopa Elementary School from USD 505 Chatopa St. Paul. And I will invite both Principal Jolene Payton and the Superintendent Craig Bagshaw up to this podium and we'll let them speak with you. Well, I'll say something first. Obviously, I have a face for radio, like uh, I've heard <laughs> others say, but this is live stream, so I'll have to get out of here. Uh, very humbled, very honored um, to be recognized today. Um, this actually, uh, this award or this recognition actually came at a time when our teachers were struggling. They were getting tired and tired and wearing thin, and you know what? What a great opportunity to uplift, uplift their spirits and to, uh, to regenerate them. So, um, you know, it's, it's amazing how impactful um, a little bit of recognition goes. So we do appreciate that and very honored to, uh, to be here today. But this young lady, uh, Miss Midget, is really the catalyst uh, for that elementary school, and she's an amazing person. And... Uh, we brought her because she has a, a face for live, live TV. <laughs> well, can I say something first? Sorry. I'm Jolene Payton. I'm the building principal. And I, um, I want to thank you for the, thank you for the award and the recognition and then giving us the opportunity to <clears throat> come here today and letting us bring Miss Midget 
she is our Title I coordinator, and she's the one that really uh, collaborates everybody and, and is, the, is, is the force behind their success. Um, I tell people that Chautauqua is a very well-kept secret because our elementary teachers and program are very, they're rock stars, and they do what they can to meet the kids' needs. And Mrs. Midget is the, like I said, the force behind it. So we're going to allow her to share with her because this is her award and, and her <laughs> elementary teacher's award. So we're going to let her uh, share some information about us. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Yes, thank you very much. This is a big deal for little Chautauqua, Kansas. So <laughs> we were very honored to receive this award. I have been the title teacher. This is my third year in Title I. And of course, we wouldn't be where we were if we didn't have the total support starting from admin to all the teachers and all the staff at Chateau Elementary. So um, we, uh, before COVID, of course, attend the MTSS symposium every year. So that is very beneficial. We bring back a lot of knowledge to the staff to help with our MTSS program. We have very strong core reading program. We make sure during our Title I small groups that we are using evidence-based interventions. We have a great positive attitude from all of our staff. And I feel like the kids feel from that and they believe that, so they're very positive and want to be successful. We have a program we use to do benchmark testing. It's formerly known as Dibbles. We call it, a, it's Cadence Reading now. And that's how we monitor our students students that aren't where they're supposed to be. We progress monitor them students to make sure they will become successful with reading. We formerly had a program, it was called the KRR program, Kansas Reading Roadmap. Unfortunately, we didn't get that this year. We weren't able to get the funds for that. So that made a huge impact. That program worked really well with our MTSS. So they were getting aligned alignment with MTSS at school, after school, summer school, and then we even had a life program, and that was a family engagement time that worked really well to, for parents to help be supportive at home with their child's reading. So sadly, we don't have that. That, was, that also came along with a wonderful, strong coordinator that ran that program. And I mean, we, like I said, we're very close. We're a small school, so we're a very close-knit um, family there that works together, always looking out for the best in every student. We're able to collaborate a lot, um, share ideas. We have, let's see, say close to 70, is it 70 from kindergarten through fifth. So a lot of our students are very one-on-one -on -one getting that direct instruction that they need. So again, thank you very much for recognizing our school for this award. We also wanted to share that we appreciate the opportunity for to go to the convention that we were able to send um, myself and Mrs. Midget, and we had three other teachers that went, gave us an opportunity to see how we're doing with the things we have implemented and uh, also afforded us ideas uh, to expand, you know, to try other things. And it was really neat, nice to visit with other people from other schools around the nation to see what they're doing and how things are going. and realize that we're pretty fortunate because we are small. You know, uh, remote learning was a little bit of a challenge, especially for elementary, and uh, we didn't have to do a lot of that. So we were pretty fortunate for that, um, gave us some ideas. We also kind of, we want to try to model that those, since we didn't get the KRR funds, we wanted to be able to model some of those uh, uh, interventions that we had with the after school program, the summer school program, and hopefully we can kind of use those ESSER funds to try to try to model that and because um, we do feel like that that was a big benefit for our kids and really helped us close the gap for our uh, kids. Uh, is there anything else we were going to try to mention? Again, we really appreciate the opportunity and the recognition and uh, it, was a, it was a great thing for Chautauqua. Got us on the map. That was our goal. <laughs> <laughs> and one big advantage I do want to say about the conference we went to, it's very nice that the videos are uploaded for a year. Oh, yeah. So it's yeah. a nice hour to go back and yeah. refer back to those, too. So that was very nice. And we look forward to maybe we can go in person next time. Yes. I think that would be very beneficial. So do you all have any questions for us? Yeah, or? Any questions? Well, we were pretty thorough then. We're, all right. We were. Good job, Mrs. Midget. See, we she's a rock to, star. We want to thank you and congratulate you. That Closing that gap, that's a, that's a tremendous uh, 
effort, and we appreciate you doing that. Uh, and on behalf of all of us, we congratulate you for doing that. But of course, I'm proud of you because you're in my district. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, as, as I said before, we typically have pictures, but and we will. But that'll be up to you because you know the social with the social distancing, we can take pictures with the commissioner right. and the uh, and your board member, which is me. Uh, or we can I can snag the commissioner, and whenever this is all over, I can. We can come there, and so whichever you, Craig, whatever you prefer. We'd love to see you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll try to do that some other time then. Okay, uh, sounds great. For, for, uh, out thank of you. an abundance of caution. Yeah. But thank you so much for being here, and, and congratulate to you, congratulate your staff, and congratulate your students. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, and make sure that uh, Craig knows there is semester funds and more coming. To, uh, to do that summer and, and that outreach. So hopefully uh, that, that can sustain you at least for a few more years in that program. And along with that note, I'd also like to share a surprise announcement for both of our districts that our title programs and services team had made a decision a couple months ago and wanted to wait to today to announce it. And I thought, Jolene, you're gonna steal the thunder at that point. But um, we have set aside funds for both Sheridan Elementary and Chautopa to actually go in person for the networking experience and the conference next February if it is in person. So congratulations and thank you very much. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Any questions? Any questions of Tate? Thank you very much. We look forward to uh, having other winners next year. Yep, thank you. Thank you so much. I now declare the Citizens Open Forum of the Kansas State Board of Education meeting open at 1025. The State Board provides this opportunity for citizens to share views about topics of interest or issues currently being considered by the State Board. The State Board asks that speakers identify themselves by name and the name of the group they represent, if applicable. The State Board also asks that each speaker focus on the remarks uh, on issues and topics. Personal attacks will not be tolerated. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Any more questions will be for clarification only. I have none. However, uh, this is scheduled for 1030 and so to be, and it's not 1030 yet, uh, and so to make sure that we allow the public to, to participate, we'll take a five minute break. And before I close, this is an open door. I love that green. Thank you, thank you. Are you getting ready for a March day? Yeah. <laughs>
and the Citizens Open Forum is closed at 1032. It says here, I'm supposed to thank the participants, but I suppose that's really not necessary. Commissioner, it's time for you. Mr. Porter, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, one, you know, I got here this morning and I got a gift that I want to share with you. Michelle and Melanie were talking about our kids, but I got a special tie that I'll be sporting tomorrow. And this is even better, uh, Michelle and Melanie, because it's my granddaughter. And uh, it's a conspiracy, I think, by the Porters and my, and, and, uh, an elementary principal of someone's granddaughter, I believe. So, uh, but thank you. So I'll be sporting that tomorrow, growing rapidly. And uh, there's not enough pictures on social media. Uh, you can you can download all 688 in the last <laughs> 100 days. I'm really glad to be with you today. I'm going to go through a lot of heavy data with you, but before uh, before I do that. I want you to know no data set tells the complete picture of a child or of a family. And so I'm gonna give you a lot of incomplete pictures that together maybe tell a story in general, but I wanna caution you about taking things and making very specific uh, answers to what we're gonna be talking about, the pandemic and the loss of the pandemic, and then uh, what we may you know, want to do about it as we go forward. So uh, I shared this with you last um, month because it was the first time I think that we had this uh, live and up and Cheryl did such a good job. It's really high resolution as we pre present this. And as I was looking at it again, it, it you know, we, we just again, by the way it's laid out, the women are dominating the top row. Dr. Horace, you can see that. Uh, and we, we only allow the guys on, on the bottom row there, but a good good looking group and I think a lot of people um, in the public maybe don't don't understand if you look at genes in in district five but certainly true even of Betty's in district eight how many voters and patrons that you represent it's an extremely large number even if you're in a small demo, uh, geographic area or a large geographic area, and I know you take your work extremely serious. This vision statement that we that we read at every board meeting, uh, over the next two days, we're gonna be talking a lot about metrics of lead the world. And we're gonna be talking about why uh, the state board has chosen certain metrics with that, why it's really hard to achieve those metrics, why it's important to do that. And also we'll be talking about the equity piece of this, which is each child, very different in very different circumstances and their success going forward. And so whenever you're at, my mom used to, it was really irritating. Um, and many of you know, had this, had this great single mom growing up. And one of the things she loved was bridge club. And so all the ladies would come over and cause havoc it, it, if you're a young boy, you know, in middle school or, you know, uh, about bridge club. But what, what was, you know, instructive about that is I often think if you're at, you know, if you're at a family reunion or you're at a Kiwanis club or you're at bridge club, ask people, what are we, what's the goal of what we're trying to do in education? We'll be talking about that a lot tomorrow. What, you know, what do we want? At the end of the day, what do we want you know, for kids and families? And that's really what drives our, our work forward. Uh, we're gonna get in the weeds a lot today on a couple of measures of social, emotional, and academic, but they're just kind of temporary stop points. You know, I, I think all of you, you know, look at your, at your own families and you think, okay, every step along the way, every journey along the way, it just presents different challenges. You know, for me right now, as, as this tie represents, it's kind of fun to watch my daughter of 34 years become a mother. And all of a sudden, her mother's a lot smarter, as you know, and, uh, you know, leans on her a lot. 
And uh, it's even fun to watch her younger brother kind of take the role of uncle. And it's a, that's a different than when they were six or 10 or 12. And so it's, it's a constant journey of adaptation and looking at strengths and then, and then you know, continuing to, to evolve into that work. Before we get to that, you probably know that over the weekend, the Senate passed the Esther three bill. It goes back to the House because it's not the same bill that came from the House. Those of you that know your civics know that. The House will probably vote uh, sometime Tuesday or Wednesday to concur with the Senate's version. I say probably because it's, it's a Democrat majority that's probably driving that. And it will likely be signed into law within a week. Is a, Gene and I were just discussing, it's a lot of money. And it comes in a lot of different ways, unemployment and stimulus checks and state aid to local governments and state governments. And it comes with money to public schools in the form of the Title I formula. As Tate was up here talking about, it'll be another, what we call ESSER three funds. What you may not know and is that there's now EANS two. That's the, that's the private school money. Another equivalent money that we saw in Kansas. Now, that may not be exactly dollar amount, but it's going to be very, very close uh, to the same dollar amount that, that private schools got before. And it will have more stipulations on how we allocate our 10% set aside. Nothing that isn't what you would have done anyway, but some states were using it in different ways. And it will go to help summer school. It will go to help uh, underprivileged kids. It will go to help train people uh, to do things. And so we'll be bringing this to you probably late spring, maybe even early summer. And the reason for the delay we're just now getting the ESSER 2 and the EANS 1, if you would, off the ground. And this can become extremely confusing to people, and we'll talk some about that tomorrow. Just wanted to give you a little, just a little update on where that was. Now, let's take a look at nationwide what we're seeing, and then I'm going to get weave into this what we see statewide. Again, I want to caution you. Because when we get to the state data, our data sets are going to be small, I mean, relative to the national, and a little bit inconsistent because not everyone takes the same assessment. This is Dibbles. You heard Chautopa talk about Dibbles. Dibbles is a um, product that you can buy, and it measures subsections of literacy and progress monitors. What you're seeing on the chart is the early grades, kindergarten to grade five nationally. On the left is the number of kids a year ago that needed intensive help, that closing the gap that Shatopa talked about. And the right, the darker graph, is where it was at this past year. And you can see nationally that the younger grades really exploded with the gap, meaning if you look at kindergarten, 28% of kids a year ago needed intense help. Nationwide, it's now 47. Here's the caution. Who's been out of school the longest in the United States? Secondary schools and urban schools, right? Large urban centers. So that'll be true when we get to Kansas. What's different about Kansas than maybe some other states is that we don't have very many urban centers relative to how much rural that we have. So that's, what, that's why I'm cautioning you as you look at this to know that Kansas may not look exactly like the national because our demographics are slightly different outside of the Kansas City area, the Topeka area, the Wichita, and to some extent Liberal Garden and Dodge City. But it's instructive for us to look at this. Here's another nationwide assessment of reading by a company that you probably, when you visit schools, you might hear them use the word fast bridge. It's, it's a cousin. Boy, the companies wouldn't like me saying that because they're, they're competitive companies. But it's a similar product to Dibbles. 
It measures reading at a very progress monitoring way. In fact, if you talk to the dyslexia people, they'll use either Dibbles or FastBridge or other models. Now, this data tells you something a little different. So what FastBridge did was they took the average from 2016 to 2019 of reading gains in kindergarten. And that's the left bar. And then they compared that average to what happened during the pandemic year of last year. And you can see that reading gains were not nearly as good nationwide as they were pre-pandemic. These are maybe dumb moments, but I think it's instructive to really look at what does what's the data tell us. And so you can see that that's a different assessment showing very similar things. And when you delve into where was that reading loss, you can see the darker bar is the summer loss we saw. This is nationwide. The lighter bar then is the pandemic loss. So phoneme segmentation, th these are all very technical terms around the reading the process of reading and the science of reading. Um, you guys are probably most familiar, uh, just as a student, of knowing what letter sounds. That's called phonics. But phoneme segmentation are things that we did when you're doing nursery rhymes and you're rhyming to alliteration and those type of things, and you're breaking apart those segments of the sounds. That was the biggest loss in those early grades, uh, both phonics and phoneme segmentation. Let's take a look at Kansas. We're gonna take a look at some data sets in Kansas. This first data set you see is by a company called Renaissance Reading. So again, school district, you can see 20, almost 26,000 Kansas students were, took this assessment. That's a fairly small number because that's multiple grades. But I'm gonna start on the right side. 2019, nationwide, 52% of kids were at or above what Renaissance compared, says is the benchmark. Now, I want to clarify what Renaissance learning says is the benchmark may be lower or higher than when Kansas sets the benchmark for being at that level and that ready. They would say 16% of the kids a year ago nationwide, you need to kind of watch them because they're kind of going in between. And then if you combine the, the lowest two, you would see that 32% were in some form of need. Nationwide, that dropped 1%. Kansas dropped 3% of the 26,000 kids that took that exam. But you'll notice that Kansas started higher than the nationwide average. And again, I want to caution you because when you're looking at multiple grade levels, 26,000 students, which sounds like a lot, is less than we have in one grade level in Kansas. We run about 40,000 kids in the younger grades, public and private. But this is a, a, an assessment that some school districts use, and you can see that there was some literacy loss. Here's FastBridge, which has more students in Kansas taking this, approximately 10 to 12,000 per grade level which would be somewhere around a third to a fourth. So, and what do you see? The left, the darker bar is last year, those students that needed intensive help. The lighter color bar is this year. And you can see in literacy, grade one and grade two were hardest hit in Kansas on this assessment in the schools that gave this assessment. The reason I always say caution, because Betty, I don't know that, that Wichita would use that, and then that would skew your statewide data, right? Either way. That's, that's why it's important to know this is a voluntary assessment through our MTSS, but it's about 10 to 12,000 kids a grade. 
So it's a larger data set than what we saw with Renaissance, but you're seeing similar trends. The younger grades in literacy looked like they lost the most during the pandemic time, appears that. Now let's look at math. Now we're going back to nationwide scores, right, as we look at math. Let me come back. Let me just pause here, Mr. Chairman, before we go to math and see if there's any questions around literacy and what we see. And as, and as you're thinking about questions, let me just say this. Generally, what we see in literacy, the younger you are, the more loss there was. These are generalizations. Special ed students tended to have a larger subset loss than non-special ed students. And the data picture is incomplete, primarily because Kansas City, Kansas has not been in school, and it's a large school district, and their assessment data is not as robust as it would have been had they been in school. That's why there's all these cautions when you look at this. But I think you, there's some generalizations that maybe people have questions about, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Betty. Okay, now that is aggregate data for Kansas? Yes, that is correct. By grade level aggregate By, data, yes. Okay, so um, if, a, if a district was trying to um, decide what level of program to to uh, make up for the loss. They would also have that information. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And they would have it in a much greater much. detail than on what I'm sharing with okay. you today. Okay. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, Dr. Watson, are, are, are we uh, on the test? Are those on, like in a monitored or what all those survey tests, whatever you're looking at there, are those on a monitored in, in a school setting, were those done in, in a school setting or were those done like online? Were, were the older students able to do if they weren't in school and tested on these things, were they able to do that at home? The answer is it's a combination, Michelle. It was done in school where possible. And if the company, in this case, FastBridge, or allowed it, some of those were done in somewhat of a monitored at-home situation. Okay. So it was both. And so again, you have to draw caveats. Yeah, it could, so it could be a manip manipulative if it's done it, for the older yes, students that have have means to have <laughs> look things up. And that's that's correct. That's why other... again you have to be cautious about this data because because we're in all type of different environments. Okay. You're absolutely correct. Thank you, Jean. I'm just curious: is this the kind of loss that can be made up through extended school year or summer programs, or is this? a loss that's going to follow some of these students for several years or more? Great question. And the real truth is, Gene, we don't know. What we believe, all right, is that because we're seeing it greatest in younger students, that if you look at the money that's being infused and that money will be good through 23 and the SR3 through 24, we're in 21, so three years, that we can make up that gap. Special ed will be more difficult because of the cognitive disabilities, but we're hopeful that with multiple summer schools, multiple extended year, tutoring services, that we can make this up over time. But we're gonna have to watch, we're gonna have to monitor this and you'll get a good sense of this by the summer of 22, if we're starting to narrow that gap, Gene. It may rebound quickly. You know, again, we just, we don't know because we've never been through this type of loss. We've been through summer loss before, but not, but not this type of loss. That's all the questions we have. Right? All right, so let's go to math. We're gonna start nationally. Again, this is fast bridge measuring mathematics. K through eight. The left bar was the growth that you normally would see in a school year on average. And the right bar, the darker bar, represents the growth this year. What do you see? This is nationwide. 
In mathematics, you see that the middle and older students are tending to struggle more in mathematics than in literacy. So it's kind of an inverse, but you're also seeing nationwide that there's greater loss in mathematics on this assessment than there is in literacy. Just one example, nationwide. Let's look at Kansas. Now this data set gets really small. You see the data set on Kansas, 14, 000, just under 14,000 students, multiple grades. Again, the students that took this Renaissance assessment, you see how high we were scoring prior to the pandemic and we dropped 9% during that time, uh, most of the, again, still above that national average, but the data set is really small with Renaissance learning. When you're 14,000 kids is, is really small, but there was a significant drop in mathematics as measured on this exam in Kansas. Here's Fastbridge Company. Same look that you saw in literacy on the left side are those that need intensive assistance in past years, and the lighter colored bar are those that need assistance this year. Now, unlike the national data, the mathematics data tends to trend like the literacy. The younger grades look like they need more assistance than the older, even though that's probably not true in grade seven. And this data set, again, has 10 to 12,000 students in each grade in this data set. So we are seeing learning loss in mathematics. What is interesting is if you look at the last decade, the science of literacy and the science of reading is pretty well come together from all researchers. Mathematics is not that tight at the younger grades. I mean, if you look at the science of how to teach mathematics, programming for mathematics, it's not nearly as validated with research at that, those grade levels as reading is. Which, when we get to interventions, that's what's going to be one of the challenges, you know, as, as we look at what's the best way to accelerate this learning for the young kids. And then I'm going to share both. This gets... Complicated, but you see our numbers are about 10,000, but start in grade three. These are our free state interim assessments. Anyone can give them. A year ago, Janet KCK gave them to every student in their school. That wasn't true this year. Last year, Betty, Wichita didn't give these at all. This year, they gave them a lot. So again, about 10,000 kids per grade. And I want you to look at winter 20 to winter of 21. That's, that's what happened between last winter and this winter. And you can see on the interim assessments in literacy that there was a drop, sometimes slight. In grade five, it was somewhat significant. And in math, winter to winter, you see a greater drop but a consistent drop across those, sometimes not as much as you see in grade three or grade eight, but in other grades, you see a more significant drop. Again, we'd love to have 40,000 kids in this data set, and I could tell you it's really solid, but it's not because it's voluntary, free data. Now, I'm gonna, I told staff yesterday in a staff meeting, I said in the next two days, I am elevating my soapbox on a lot of things, all right? It's time for all of us, myself and you, to get serious about what we have to give guidance to schools on. I mean, really, really, and not that you haven't, but really get tied on that. This is a free exam. It costs school districts nothing. They can give it four times a year, and it gives predictive value to our own state assessments, which by standards and cut scores are the highest standards and cut scores in the nation. All right? 
This gives that predictive value to that. And we're gonna make those even better from a reporting standpoint for school districts. So school districts can spend money on all the others and, and that's great in the early, and they can continue to do that. This is free to them, paid for by you. State Board of Ed writes the contract to KU to provide this service in reading and mathematics. We're gonna soon have it, we'd like to have it at some point in science, but we're gonna get better at this over time. So that's one of the things. When people say we can't afford whatever, this is free. Now it only starts at grade three, but from three to grade 10, they have four times a year free assessments. Teachers have the standards in formative assessments free to them that they can give it any time during the year. Social emotional data, and then you'll have a lot of questions. We have a question. Okay, all right, let me back up. Okay, sure. Betty. When you were showing the, the information, it did not make a distinction between remote and in-person, it was just no. It's, it's both, Betty. It's both. Yes, it's, it's it was able, on. you were able to give this remotely. Uh, Kansas City, Kansas decided not to do that, and they had been doing it. But some districts did, and some districts did it in person. And as Michelle said, be cautious, because you could have had some kids that, you know, manipulated that data. It's one of the challenges in this environment that we've been in. So will we have... Um Oh, I, I know that this is just kind of an indicator, but moving forward, as we start looking for ways to mitigate the loss, will we, what's in place to actually get more definitive data for decisions? Excellent question. Almost like I planted it with you. You did. In April. I, I, wrote, I read it. <laughs> state assessments will be given to every student in school. They must come to school to take it even if they're remote or hybrid. That data will be compared back to 19, right? Because we missed 20. And that data set will be the most complete data set we will have going into the summer. We'll have those results in May, by the way. We'll have them before we get to summer. And that'll either validate this data or show us different that we can then start to use even as early as the summer to start to make improvements. So. Just one follow-up. Um, so when we start looking at, at models to recommend, there's actually nothing that could be done until we get that data. Is that correct? I don't know that nothing can be done. I think school districts are already looking at their own data that I'm sharing with you. And in a, in a district, you might have everyone taking one of these exams, and that would tell you great things. When we look at it as an aggregate across the state, Betty, you just have to be careful because not every student in the state of Kansas is taking it. But if in Great Bend, every student has taken Fast Bridge or Dibbles, then you would have a great data set to already start to use. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanna point out that in the English language arts category, there is a year over year increase, increase for grades six and 10. Am I reading that correctly? Yes. Okay, so knowing that there are significant differences in, in how these kids test remotely or in person, I'm proctored, um, and I'm kind of jumping ahead here because you, you did too. Um, if the state's going to be doing new assessments this spring that will be proctored, I have some concerns, I guess, about how we're going to make sure that we get all of those kids into buildings to take that test because I have already started hearing from parents who say my kid's not setting foot in a building, there's no way. It's a great question. So we, we're required by the federal law and required by the state law to give state assessments. That was both waived at both sides in the pandemic. It's not been waived this year by either the federal government or the state government. The federal does allow some waiver of accountability for how you use it to judge schools that, that we'll probably use. But one of the challenges is the federal law requires 95% participation or you get thrown out in a normal year, Melanie. Now the question is, what kind of participation are we going to have? Because parents might say, I'm not coming in to take it. And then does that drop Johnny Missions below 95% or does that drop um, 
Anderson County is below 95%. I don't know. So we're going to have, that will be one of the watch fors as we go forward. But assuming that we're close to the percent that we gave, at least statewide, uh, in 19, we'll be able to make probably better determinations and have a better data set than what we're seeing statewide on these. But you're right. Parents may refuse to go in. Yeah, I think this may be an opportunity to provide guidance for districts so that they can do a better job of getting messaging out to those parents so they understand what's at stake here and they understand how important it is to have those kids in the buildings for those tests. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and you notice I always say, be cautious how we use data because it tells an incomplete picture. We do the comparison to 19 to 21. We're gonna to have to look at participation rates and we're gonna to have to look at that by school district also. But what we anticipate we're gonna see is a learning loss created by a pandemic. That's what we believe we'll see based upon this data, but we've got to validate that. Okay, Ben. Whoops, sorry, Ben. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is just a clarification on this. Fall of 20 is accurate on that, correct? Yes. Okay. Is it just because different schools took it in the winter of 20 versus the fall of 20? No. No. So the fall, you you can compare the fall of 19 to the fall of 19, uh, 20. Mm -hmm. And you see in some cases there was gains. Mm -hmm. And she has my score. But, but, I'm, but we were looking at the winter of 20 to the winter of 21. It, because she has my score. No, in some cases there were gains. Okay. Oh, okay. So the twenty. I'm reading the years wrong. I'm sorry. That's that's. I'm, that's why I tried I'm to. I'm in highlight. calendar year. Yeah. Of twenty. No, I'm like, no. wait, we wouldn't have had winter of twenty one. Right. Oh, we, school yeah, year. So. I'm sorry. So yeah. When the school year ends. So the winter of twenty one is this current school year. That's correct. Okay. Yes. That helps fix a lot of those numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Now let's look at social emotional because a lot of you and you know that social emotional ranges from as far in as I'm really depressed thinking about committing suicide, that's the most extreme, to I just have a sense of loss of being with my friends and you know the normalcy, it's all of that. This is uh, the FastBridge data called Sabres, and this is survey data. The number sets are fairly small. You're seeing about 4,000 kids and I want to focus here on the far right, not at risk, at risk. This, these are teachers, survey data of the students that they serve. And you can see there's not a lot of difference between 19 and 20 data on this fair, fairly small data set. So I'll just look at, let's just look at second grade. A year ago, 83.84% of students or teachers said 83% of kids are not at risk. 16% are social emotionally. This year was 82.97 and 17. It's not statistically different. And if you look across grade levels, it's pretty, it's pretty across the board, right? Again, go down to sixth grade, 87 to 87. I mean, almost spot on. It's the same, but let me tell you what we saw. In the data set from Sabres, limited data, again, it's not 40,000 kids a grade, teachers said we don't see much different than we saw a year ago. Kids told a different story. Kids on about a 10% basis said we feel more loss than we did a year ago, about 10% higher at every grade level on the people that did this assessment. Now, some of the larger districts also shared with me their aggregate data. And I won't tell you which ones, and I wanna keep privacy because this, is, this data needs to be really private because it's social emotional data and it may involve you know, depression and other things. Uh, but some of the larger districts uh, just share with me their data. And same thing. Teachers did not see what the kids said was some social emotional loss at exactly the same equivalent. So 
if we take the students at their word, which is we're asking them, we should. Not that we shouldn't take the teachers too. They're seeing it a little different. When we, when we get to the next stage and think about, as Gene said, the summer and extended school year, we've got a social emotional loss that may range from, golly, I just want to rip the mask off and be with my friends and play the sport without worrying about a quarantine to I'm really going to be, I'm really anxious if I've got to go back to school face to face and I don't want to, you know, everything in between, right? And we've got a learning loss academically. Does this make sense? So it begs as we go forward to really look at what's occurred and then model what we want to see over 21, 22, 23, and 24 with money from the federal government to help this side and the academic side. Last thing into navigating next. This is the post-secondary impact of COVID nationally, and then I'll share with you the state. On the far left, by the way, you'll have all this chart and graph. Uh, on the far left, the blue, kids that graduated high school nationally that were going to go on to earn a certificate program. Gene, they were going to go to the John Deere program that you and I have talked about. These are kids going to be a welder, electrician, John Deere program, the Harley-Davidson program, all right? Certificate programs. 79% of those kids said, I'm going to change my plans nationwide. Almost 80%. 54% of them canceled going. This is nationwide. More than half didn't go. And 26% went, but maybe in a remote environment. Now, watch what happens. If I said I was going to go to Cowley County or Colby Community College, I want, to, want you to focus first on the yellow bar. 54% of kids going to certificate program nationwide said we didn't go. That dropped to 10% for associate. And if I was going for associate, 44% of those kids said I'm not going. This is nationwide. Baccalaureate, look how it drops. This is instructive because we're seeing a gap from those going on to four-year college and those going on certificate and associate degrees, and it's stark. Meaning those going on to college nationwide, only 25% of those kids delayed going or didn't go. But over half of the kids going to the certificate program didn't go. And then finally... Graduate programs were somewhere in between. Now, this is nationwide data. Let's look at income. If, I, if the family made less than $50,000 a year, again, I want you to focus on the, the yellow. In the low to mid-40s, those kids did not go on to whatever plans they had. So, so now we're combining all the plans by income nationwide. Does that make sense? If I made under 50, my household made under 50,000, 42 to 46 percent of those kids did not go to certificate. They didn't go to a community college. They didn't go to college. If I made between 50 and 100,000, that number dropped into the upper 30s, meaning they tended to go on a little bit more than the kids that came from families making 50. If my family made over $100,000, I went. Look at that. Look how stark that is by income. Starts at 30%. If I made 150 or more, I'm down to 25%. If my family made over 200,000, I'm down below 20% of not going to where I said I was going to go. Compare that to making 50,000, which was that 40% nationwide. We have to look at the Kansas data, which I'm going to share with you, but this is the class of 20. This is, so as we think about the class of 21, this is what worries us. Because Gene, you mentioned earlier, can we make this loss up and what's the time? Will these kids come back? I don't know that question, that answer, right? We know generally, you know what happens 
kids say, I'm just going to take a year off. They rarely come back. Not that some don't, but the, a lot of kids, I'm taking a gap year, and, you know, I'm going to set out a year. They don't, the odds of coming back are not good. Well, these kids, because it's a different, it's a pandemic, we don't know. But we can't let the class of 21 show the same thing because this is disproportionately, at least nationwide, impacting certificate associate and poverty. Mr. Porter? Question for Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I'm just making some notes here. Just This is just relating to Kansas and what I know in Kansas. Um, t talking with many friends that went into like a CTE program, a lot of those places, they, they couldn't go. They didn't, couldn't do hands-on. They couldn't do welding. They couldn't. So, and if they're paying for that, maybe it's a local thing, they're living at home part-time or that, um, unless they had a, you know, scholarship or something like that, that's going to be, that's going to affect that uh, as far as like, do I want to pay the money right now when I can't go in there and actually, like I, do, do instead of going on to the mechanic store and being able to get that job maybe part-time <clears throat> and being, and they're still open and they're working, you've gone to a school that's closed that would provide, normally provide that hands-on training. Um, and then you had, an, I have another friend that went down to a, a college in Southern Kansas. He was promised lots of things and, and luckily he had scholarships. So he was going anyway, he was going to be going a lot of his, his, um, his, um, education was being paid for. So he's thinking he's going to be doing the labs were pulled. They didn't, they weren't able to go into an actual lab. Um, so I'm thinking some of these people are thinking, well, I mean, you know, if I'm paying for this, I'm not, I'm not mm -hmm. going to be paying. So I think they will probably come back as long as they can get on track and get back in these classrooms and actually do hands-on lab work and things like that and not just look at videos. And a lot of those kids, it, it doesn't work for some of those, <laughs> some of those degrees are going into. So I guess I, again, it's, it's it, it, it's skewed based on talking to different people and why they've maybe pulled back a little bit. It could be the money. It could be that they just aren't getting the hands-on experience that they were promised or that that place is closed down or it, because it's related to a school in Kansas, it's shut down. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they, if maybe if they had gone to just gone to a job and part-time and had that experience at the local mechanic or wherever it is, they would be able, they would have more, in, the interest level would be higher then now they got to sit home and just watch a video, and it's 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 like culinary. It's like all the things my child was in woods class. You know, right. it's the same kind of thing. I mean, he's able to do some of the things when they were in classroom, but sanding and basically staining at home. That was it, and the, and the rest of it was video. So it's a it, we'll have to just kind of go back and remeasure again. We're going to have to talk yes. to these kids because there's a lot of there's a lot of manipulative data on that that just just from talking to people and getting out there and talking to college students and talking to parents and that there's a lot of um what ifs or you know i'm hoping that that's the case but i i think a, a lot of it has to do with their area was just yeah shut down. agree i mean this is pandemic related caused right and we and we know exactly what you said there's reasons why they did what they did but when we look nationwide it's interesting when you look at it demographically between you know, the, the certificates to associate or income level, who decided to go and then who said, well, this isn't worth it because I want a tech school and I'm not going to get a tech school environment because a lot of those were shut down. Or, you know, or if you're going to a four-year college, you were going to be online and maybe you decided that's okay, I'll still do it. Yeah. it. There's reasons why people did what they did. The real question is the class of 20, Michelle, as you just said, what will they do come the fall of 21 when we should be fully vaccinated and fully open, will they come back? Because traditionally in non-pandemic, the majority don't come back. We're hopeful they do, but what can we do to assist families that are even in the class of 20 to still go fulfill whatever their dreams are? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jean. Uh, in looking at this, it, it really occurs to me that this is gonna have a significant impact on the the workforce of the future um, and, and the availability of sufficiently trained and educated uh, individuals. Are, is KBOR and, and the chamber involved with looking at this data and trying to, to plan ahead? Yes, and let me share that with you and talk about uh, that. It's good and go forward. So let's first of all show you a map the lighter the color, the more students went on whatever their plans were. So 
South Dakota really, we're, we're pretty good relative to other states. I only show you that because sometimes it's instructive. You know, most of the time, you, you know what I say. We live in Kansas. Let's make Kansas the greatest place for kids. And, yeah, you know, if New Mexico really got hit harder or Louisiana, we feel bad for them. But our, our policies aren't going to affect that. Here's what happens statewide to the class of 20. The region's enrollment fell 4%. Across the board, tech schools, community college, four-year. Kansas students going to a region's fell 6%, meaning they made up for it by out-of-state students. We're 6% off. Community college, technical college, four-year colleges in Kansas. These are the Kansas students staying in-state at Pittsburgh, Emporia, Washburn Tech, uh, Northwest uh, Technical College. But not, a, you know, the majority of Kansas kids stay in state, they're not all. Some go to Arkansas and Creighton and other places, Harvard, Stanford. And uh, some students go to independent private colleges in Kansas. That enrollment fell 6% in Kansas. I say private college, it's Kansas private college, but Kansas students fell 21%. Mid-American Nazarene, Bethany, Southwestern College. I'd say that in honor of Sally, who's not here anymore, but proud graduate. Of. We're off. The class of 20, again, as Michelle said, why? Lots of reasons. Lots of reasons. Million-dollar question is, will they come back? Here's what scares Gene, us, and Kabor, is that FAFSA completions for the class of 21 are off 19% from a year ago. That's financial aid that you fill out in order to qualify for scholarships and Pell Grants. It's off by 19% from a year ago. Now, the Coordinating Council is working on this, has identified that, and we've got the Kansas Chamber on there too. If people come back, we're okay. If they don't, as Gene said, we're going to have an under-educated workforce for Kansas at a time that we're trying to get a higher educated. It's an unknown. I don't want to panic you. It's just we're painting the picture for what we have to do coming out of the pandemic. And, and thus, as we go forward here, it's navigating next, which you've adopted. And all of these are important, vaccinating your staff, but we've got to take a look at the class of 21. We have a little competition that we joined with K Board called, is your high school going to be number one in having percent of families fill out the FAFSA? And in June, we're going to give those awards. You know, just kind of a friendly competition, trying to encourage every high school, go capture the class of 21 and help families make this transition to whatever they want to do because it appears, how many times have I said this today? It appears that we'll have fully vaccinated population by the summer, if not sooner, which you saw the CDC guidelines about opening already. The fall of 21 is looking very promising. We've got to think about recovery. And for the class of 21, we don't have two, three, four years as we work with them. So when you look at this document, it lays out for school districts what we need to do now for the class of 21, what we need to do looking back to the class of 20 and pulling them in. There's money, right? There's money. We've got bring in extra people, bring in your community. Invite them back in. What are we going to do this summer? Kids should be in engaging, fun, enriching social environment with good learning. We should be really pushing for extended school year. And last week, I went ballistic on Brad because we had a school district call. They were in some meetings, and they said to the people trying to help them about coming up, we don't have any money. 
We do. And we have an opportunity. This board has an opportunity. Local boards, every school district, we're tired, right? Everyone's tired of the pandemic. Everyone's irritated. But we have an opportunity over the next several months to years to make an impact that you've always dreamed about making in every community. And we need to take advantage of that. And we need to push hard and look at the data and what the data tells us. We, this document lays out the guidelines to do that. Every local community can custom and do that well. But G and I have had conversations about year-round school. Not a bad conversation to have locally. There's money to do that. I'm talking full pay of people. People are tired. I understand that. Parents are tired. Kids are tired. But we have an opportunity, Mr. Chairman. And uh, we, should, we should do everything we can to try to take advantage of that over the next two to three years, including the next two or three months. With that, I'd stand for questions. And... Uh we're going to talk about it a lot more tomorrow, but I want to reinforce something that Randy said. There is a lot of money out there that can be spent helping kids catch up. Hearing the excuse, we don't have the money, is simply not valid. And we need to figure out some way to make sure that we hold the feet to the fire. Uh, because they have the money is there if it's spent properly, and the task force is there to make sure that it is spent properly. Uh, and we really need to push for those things. If we need to be aggressive to the point of being obnoxious, that's okay. Betty. Thank you. Do we um, have any information that would show fluctuation and whether students, those students that uh, are not on track, I, I don't know if that's grown any uh, to graduate. You're talking about the, the graduating class. We don't have any data. Our data on graduation is always in arrears at our level, meaning you won't know about the class of 21 until we get to the fall of this fall, and then you'll know. We've been increasing graduation rates. We've been increasing the number of kids going on to post-secondary, but it looks like, you know, in the class of 20 and 21, we're going to have some challenges, Betty. Yeah. Um, but we, we've been making strides there. Now, will we hit a wall? I, I think I think the you know many of our Kansas schools have been in in person most of the time this year. I think they're going to be fine, but our larger systems have been remote, hybrid, or some combination. And I think the challenge will be as we most of them are coming back sometime in March. Is we got to make sure the class of twenty one is our first focus because they're going to be out the door and. What, two and a half months? Right. They're going to be gone. And so that's going to be a, that, that, when we talk to local, you know, Dina, when you're back, Salon is going to have to address that, right? Are, are we on track to graduate? Because the anecdotal, Michelle and I can talk and say, hey, some kids are and some kids aren't. But we're going to have to address that first. And then we're, are they ready for their plans? Are, are they signed up for the military? Are they ready to go to Allen County, wherever they want to go? That's, that's, again, us talking to local boards and local people about make, making sure that the class of 21 is, is on our forefront um, taken care of. Ben. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have three questions, but one of them will probably be answered tomorrow. Um, my first one is the EANS 2 money. Is that going to be dispersed? The same way ESSER was, 2 was, or is it ESSER 1? No, ESSER 1 went flowed through title. Yeah. EANS 2 will be distributed just like e this EANS round is. Competitive, have to apply. And no direct money, but services only. Correct. Well, they, right. No no money to them. They can buy product, but that can, is owned by the state and services. And So the EANS 2 is set up like the December yes. EANS money? Yes. Okay, you know my feelings on that. Um, um, on that front, the other question, and, and I don't want you to answer it today because we're going to talk about it in depth tomorrow, but uh, what is the priority, and this might be a question for the chairman tomorrow, and I know you guys are going to get into it, is the focus of the ESSER money. Are we prioritizing 
expenditures based on the learning losses, the math, the English, or the reading scores toward those programming. And again, we're talking about that tomorrow on agenda, yeah. so that can wait till tomorrow. The second one is, do we have data on second year students in post-secondary? Because that also affects the post-secondary success rate of all of our schools and that data set. Um, in terms of that, when I talk to my colleges and I'm blessed with 10 wonderful post-secondary institutions in my district, what I've heard from them is that the incoming class, there was a drop. It wasn't bombshell. They've had those kind of drops before. But what really caught their attention is the lack of returning students from the previous year because that also dropped precipitously more than any other data set. Um, that was really alarming is the lack of returning students. So do we have data on freshman to sophomore data? Because the data you shared was just the incoming freshman class, correct? That is correct. Um, do we have data on that? We, we have incomplete data. We'll have complete data sets this summer, Ben, okay. on what happened to that returning student. The class of 19? Yes. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Randy, thank you for your report. You know, it, it sounds awful, but you know, in the awful is opportunity. <clears throat> and I hope tomorrow that we start to address the issues that we face, not with the solutions, <clears throat> or excuse me, not the, with the <clears throat> status quo of the past. This gives us a great opportunity because the one thing that's, that keeps resonating with me as you were going through is IPS. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't, it, it's big data points, but the data point I'm worried about is the each, each kit, and each one's gonna be a little different. And we can't address the future by bringing the status quo of the past forward. So I'm really looking forward to tomorrow's uh, dialogue and uh, the, 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 the aid and enthusiasm we're gonna have for redesign, which fits right in. And I, I, I've listened over the past several months and the schools that seem to be, districts that seem to be handling this the best are those that were already engaged in redesign. So I'm looking forward to uh, redesign being one of the core values of uh, moving forward for the benefit of the, of the students that we, we serve. We, you know, I, all of you have a different story to tell about your children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews. But, you know, we were just having a brief conversation. Michelle's kids are different than Melanie's. It's, and it's, that's the way it is when you have a half a million, public and private, they're all different. Our system was made to have minor, as you know, Jim, accommodate minor differences, right? That IPS turns it on its head. And we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to accelerate this, and we're going to have to demand that we all work at this together to do that. It's really hard work, but we have the opportunity to do it in front of us. And. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Randy, I'm just looking at the numbers. Does it look like um, ESSER 3 is going to be over a billion for Kansas? Because that's what I'm guessing. No, Ann. Uh, well, I, no, no, you say for Kansas. There's other, I'm talking about the school money. Looks like it's going to be just under $600 million. Really? Okay. Um, no, I haven't, we haven't seen the printouts on that. But there will be some state and local money, and there will be some other money. But... So about twice what we got into? Uh, about, one, it's a little bit over one and a half what we got into. Okay, and proportionate for private schools? Yeah, uh, oh. private schools will see a doubling. Doubling, oh, okay. I'm sorry, they'll see, they'll see the same same amount of money coming. Same proportion, oh, yes. same as they got into? That's correct. Gotcha, okay. Yeah. Um, it, isn't that Sabres survey free? Yes, the, well, okay. no, it's, it's through FastBridge, but it comes with the subscription to FastBridge. Okay, because I was thinking at one time we said that first level in Sabres was free to all the schools, and then if you went beyond that, they had to pay for it. But maybe things have changed since we first learned about I'll it. I'll check into that, and to make okay. sure that I'm telling you correctly. Um, do, can we use ESSER money to reach back to the 2020 class? Yes. And do you hear schools talking about that, or are they kind of like, they're not my job anymore? Well, I don't think they're saying they're not my job. They're probably focused on the immediate and the future. Uh -huh. Any ESSER money, any Ian's money can reach back to March of 2020. 
Okay. So that's important for you to know, and we'll discuss that more tomorrow. But it is all you can reimburse back to any expense of 2020 and any uh, any cost that would have been related to the pandemic back to a year ago. Okay. And do you hear schools talk? We were talking about summer school, like, well, everybody will want to come back and teach. And I'm thinking, you know, if I've been through this year, I'm not sure I want to come back for summer school. So do you hear districts talking about negotiating now for con obviously they're going to have to have a new contract if people are going to come in for the summer yeah and i don't know sherry probably has a better idea of that than i do in terms of the negotiation process i do know that if districts that have been in person and also teaching remotely which mm -hmm. is the majority of the districts they're tired yeah this has been a heavy lift for a long time you know a full calendar year uh, but if you go to navigating change, okay, this is, comes back to the structure. We really need to put teams of teachers together so they can shoulder the load and not be so isolated. It, it really begs for a different structure, as Jim said, completely looking at how we, how we formulate going forward. And, and those that, you know, aren't going to be available this summer, or th that will be fine. You know, we, maybe we do some other things. The community can play a great role in this, too. Okay. So, the only other thing was, I know um, I had sent you a note about year-round school. Do you think we need somebody on staff working on a year-round school concept to help districts who are kind of thinking about going that way so they all don't reinvent the wheel? Well, if, if we have a big push for that, uh, uh, Gene asked the exact same question that you did, Ann, uh, of me. If you look, and if we do summer school, let's just say, in June through mid-July and take a little bit of time and then start school an extended year in August, you almost have a year-round school for the next two or three years without calling it year-round. Um, I mean, I mean without yeah. formalizing it. Um, and so I think if, if school districts say, you know, we want to look at that, then yes, I think we, we but, um, but we haven't had any of that. Right now, I think we're thinking more summer school, extended school year which with a few breaks would be the same. And again, parents, come back to Michelle's comment about coming in for testing, parents may say, my kid's tired and they don't want to come in. So we got, you know, this isn't, we've got to work together of how we're going to do this. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I've been pushing for year-round school for 30 years, but maybe this is the time somebody will actually pay attention. Gene. I just had a question. Um, in the past, and I think currently, we have some organizations that supplement um, what our districts do. Maybe they run an after-school program or something like that. Um, is there any possibility of uh, any of those uh, actually getting more involved in a summer program to kind of relieve the, the teachers of that additional um, time and, and give them a chance to take a break? Yes. Yes, the money could go for that too. Boys and girls clubs, uh, you know, um, pr sp uh, very specific programs like the Cosmosphere, right? Uh, you know, doing something or zoos or, you know, uh, parks and rec. Uh, yes. And that, we would want this, again, part of our redesign is engage your community. Don't just think about your own resources. Engage your community resources. You know, in the smaller communities, that's they, they're more limited. But you know, think about your broader region uh, communities. And we, our next agenda item, we have a remote person, so we need to get there as quickly. We're a little behind, but I'm Dina. I'm going to call on Dina. This will be our last question on this subject because we have multiple opportunities to discuss some of these things tomorrow. All day tomorrow. Okay, Dina. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thinking about the class of 2020 and how a school district might engage, are we just talking about engaging them or are we talking about discovering that maybe there were gaps that occurred in that last COVID experience that they all got the experience 
instead of maybe removing a gap, one became larger in the last nine weeks or so. So does the school district also have the, abil the ability to go back and provide for any kind of uh, education that might be needed for that to fill that gap? So That's would that be done through a summer program then? That's a little bit more complicated, Dina, not so much from the federal money or what can be done, but let's assume the student graduated high school. Then those services tend to end a little bit in terms of helping the, what doesn't though, what could still be done, is go back to Michelle's, let's go talk to the families of those kids of the 20 and say, what happened and are you interested? Do you need any assistance in going where you want? Are you happy? Or, you know. So you could still provide those. The academic services are a little bit more difficult if the student's already graduated. Okay. Might also say, and we'll talk about this more tomorrow, but you know, you can also extend, you know, the 18 to 21 year old program on special ed. You can also during now you'll have to use the pandemic money to fund it, because state money can't be used. You could fund a 22 year old at the school for the blind to come in and be extended one more year because maybe that disruption happened. Uh, we got, a, I think, a, a letter from a parent, I think in one of your two regions, that said, hey, the school did a really nice job, but I didn't want my kid because of underlying conditions to be in the school. Is there any way to extend it? And the answer is yes, all right, with the federal money. Uh, now, that's an option. All these are options that local districts can do. I think what we want to do is make sure they understand those and help help them maximize their resources and going forward. Yeah, and I had several people that contacted me about the extension of that 21, and I think it's really important that we make sure that that school districts know that they have that option and, and quite frankly, encourage it. So, Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, we're scheduled to break, but I think that we'll just not take it. Uh, and we have uh, Stephen King that's going to be presenting to us. Is Katie available? Yes, sir. And Katie Hendrickson is from code.org. Welcome to the State Board of Education. Is the, is the blue light on? I don't hear myself. Okay, I hear myself. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm excited to come up and talk to you about where we have been, um, what we've been doing over the past year. Many of you will remember that a couple years ago, I presented the new model standards for computer science for the state of Kansas. Um, those were adopted in April of 2019. Um, then I brought to you five steps of recommended um, implementation plans from the committee that had been, or the task force that had been meeting. Um, and those were approved in February of last year with some requests for, for clarification. Um, and we have been working diligently on those. Um, it's been kind of a really kind of a long, strange trip as far as the past 12 months have gone, as, as many of us have talked about, and, and the commissioner um, you know, talked about our um, <clears throat> our ability to meet in person and that sort of thing. But um, plus, our, our attention span really hasn't sometimes been on more the navigating next topics than they have been on on specific computer science things. But we've um, accomplished some things, and I'm happy to be able to talk to you briefly about um, where we are, and then um, have Katie Hendrickson from Code.org um, to talk about on a national level um, what she's seeing status-wise, policy-wise, um, nationally. So. Um, Katie, if I could, I'm going to go through my five recommendations real quick and then leave it uh, to you. <clears throat> so the first recommendation adopted by the Board of Education was to create a dedicated statewide computer science education position, and, and once again, we've done that. Um, I actually took that position 
um, 13 months ago, last February, and I've been working in that position ever since, um, working with our new math person and our science person. Um, we have what we call the STEM cell upstairs, um, and we're really kind of enjoying working on um, tech education and STEM education in general across the state of Kansas. So um, the purpose of this position, of course, is to gather task forces, it's to talk about policy, it's to, um, sometimes I talk, and I probably shouldn't put it this way, but preaching the gospel of computer science education across the state of Kansas. I'm actually really looking forward to being able to travel um, here pretty soon again, um, and actually get out across the state of Kansas. I will say, you know, I've been talking about computer science for the past three years that I've worked with KSDE, and the reality is I've never met a single building or district leader who hasn't agreed that computer science tech education is important. I'm sorry, who, who said that it wasn't important. Um, it's, it's a commonly held belief, I think, through Kansas um, that this is a very important topic. Um, it's not really a question of why should we, it's generally a question of how do we. And so that's what we've been working on. We've been working on creating PD um, and some other things to, to help the field out. Recommendation number two was to encourage all schools to offer computer science. As you know, Kansas is a very local control oriented state. Um, some states have mandated that every school offer computer science, um, which I, my personal dream is to see a day when every single Kansas student has the opportunity to take a computer science course. On the other hand, I also recognize, and I've got some data here, um, we just don't really have the capacity for that right now. If we required every school to offer a computer science course, as was um, put through the legislature a couple years ago, um, it, it would be really hard to, to have those classes taught in many of the districts out there, many of the districts that you represent. So um, the encouragement is ongoing. I do want to point out, uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Watson actually pointed out that sometimes numbers don't tell the whole story. And there are several statistics relating to how many schools offer computer science, both statewide and, and nationwide. Um, Code.org's numbers, as I think Katie will present, are about 26, 27% of high school buildings in the state of Kansas offer a computer science course as defined by them. Um, and again, the, the definition by them is, is, I think, valuable because what they're trying to do is put all states on the same um, statistical platform, if you will. Um, you know, what I call a computer science course and what my colleague Anthony Owen in Arkansas calls a computer science course may be two different things. <clears throat> now, what I do call computer science course, if you just look at the restrictive list of AP courses, programming courses through the state of Kansas right now, um, 55 districts, 95 high school buildings um, offer a computer science course if you take the very restrictive view. That's out of 499 high school buildings, 286 districts. So by, by my more restrictive numbers, it's actually about 21%. However, if you take the little bit more liberal view of, of what a computer science course is, and I typically look at technical and application courses in all four IT pathways, because I'm not one to say that my, my own personal background is, for example, cabling infrastructure. And to me, that's computer science as well. So if you look at that, it's actually 49% of our school buildings, our high school buildings, offer a computer science course. The other part of that statistic to tell the whole story is that if you look at the districts that, that are in that, even that 21% number, it's the districts like USD 501, USD 259, uh, Blue Valley, DeSoto, um, Shawnee Mission, those districts that serve a large number of our students across the state. Now, it's also school districts like Wamego, um, Haven, um, some of the smaller districts too, and I really appreciate that, but it is important to understand that when we say 21, 26% of the, of the school buildings only offer, or only 21, 26% of the school buildings offer computer science, those are some of the biggest school buildings in the state. Recommendation number three is one that we've been kind of struggling with. Computer science should satisfy a core graduation requirement. As presented about a year ago, um, Kansas is the one state, uh, the 49 states that, that allow computer science to, uh, to be a core graduation requirement. Now the challenge with that is if you're looking at how the other states are doing it, there are actually about 49 different ways they're doing it. So for example, Arkansas, my colleague in Arkansas I bring up several times, um, 
they actually require four math courses, one of which can be a technical math course, and the computer science can count as a technical math course. Still can't count as one of the, you know, the, one of the core maths. And so as we've done this, we've approached this from the standpoint, okay, what can we do to emphasize the importance of computer science while not handicapping the student's ability to go on to post-secondary efforts and understand enough math and science and English language and that sort of thing. Um, so we've been meeting upstairs. Again, it's uh, the, our math consultant, our science consultant are all on board with this. They, they do believe in the importance of computer science, computational thinking, coding, that sort of thing. And so we've been working on building a basically a white paper for districts. Because as was brought up about a year ago, Districts in Kansas right now have the ability to count a computer science course as one of their core graduation requirements. So how do we give guidance to the districts in how we look at doing that? And how do we give guidance to the districts in how they can, they can make computer science count while not diminishing from the students' math ability? As an example that I've been using, uh, New Mexico actually passed their law. They allow computer science to count for a math course on the condition that students have already taken Algebra two and Geometry, which are typically years two and three in math, and have passed the state assessment. So it can count as a core graduation requirement in Mexico if they've already done all three of their math requirements. So that's the kind of guidance that we're actually looking at building into this particular document. Um, unfortunately, I, I'd hope to have it done. It's not done yet. Um, I hope to have it able to present to our leadership team um, here in the next month or two um, and be able to you know, be before the board and send it out to the field here, um, hopefully relatively soon. It is still in, in, in operation or in, in working though. Recommendation four is also in process, creating a licensure endorsement. Now we had one. Um, we actually had a computer studies licensure endorsement up till about 2000. And in fact, if you pull the data, and we have, we've looked at the uh, licensure endorsement for the five courses that we're looking at that we're considering computer science in the high school. So basically the two AP courses, the IB course, and the two programming course codes. If you look at those, there are currently 55 teachers teaching those five courses across the state of Kansas. Out of those 55, 19 have the existing computer studies endorsement. Many of the rest of them have CTE endorsements. They have uh, you know, the ability to teach the course based upon the, the part five of the licensed personnel guide. Um, what TLA is working on, and we've been actually having several meetings, had a meeting um, about a little bit over a week ago where we split up into five subcommittees to work, on, I'm on each one of the five. Um, to kind of shore out some of the other areas of the, the, the teacher endorsement um, standards, which are a little bit broader than just the academic student and, um, standards, if you will. Recommendation number five is arrange funding. And um, you know, one of the common questions I get when I talk about this is funding for what? Um, well, we do have existing Title II professional development funding. I have been running professional development. It, it actually hasn't cost a lot because all of the PD right now is over Zoom. Um, so I don't have to travel anywhere, but I'm hoping to be able to do some road shows. I'm hoping to be able to um, do a lot more. I'm actually talking to one of my colleagues at K-State about what rigor means um, in a non-assessed um, computer science technical career field. What, what does rigor mean as opposed to say rigor in math where we actually have an assessment? And so once I get a little bit more uh, scholarly, I guess, approach to that, I hope to be able to present some PD on, on that as well. Um, again, that, that's, that, that comes from existing funding. Um, we, we've been looking at other things. Our, our focus has shifted a little bit because instead of looking at computer science education, what we've been looking at is seeing how computer science, tech, and STEM can all benefit with the ESSER issues that the commissioner was talking about. How do we use our fields to help bring students back up to where they should be grade level wise standard? And, and I know that computer science isn't part of math, nor is it part of English language, um, but it can be used in some of this. And so, um, it, it's it's a it's a tool, and so we have been looking at how do we how do we bring that to the table to help with our current existing situation. 
So those are the five recommendations that, uh, that, that we got approved last year. Um, there has been some work done. There's obviously some work still to be done and, and I'm excited to continue this effort. It's, it's exciting for the students at Kansas. Um, let me real quick turn it over to Katie and Katie, um, you can add what you'd like. Welcome, Katie. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for the welcome. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. I am going to try to share my screen here. Um, I have, oh, it looks like I cannot screen share while the other participant is sharing. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right, let me know if at any point you can't see my slides. Um, I'll go through these quickly. I know you all have a lunch break coming up, but thank you so much. I wish I could be there in person. We're not able to travel right now, um, but I definitely think fondly of my times uh, in the past, in 2019 and 2020, being able to be there with you all in person. So one day I'll be there again. Um, so I'm going to share some information from Code.org, the Computer Science Teachers Association, and the Expanding Computing Education Pathways Alliance uh, from our 2020 State of Computer Science Education report. Um, so first of all, why is this important? Um, looking at last month's data in the state of Kansas, there were about 2,000 open computing jobs, 74% of which require a bachelor's degree, um, not necessarily in computer science, but certainly would require some computing knowledge. And yet, uh, in the most recent data that we have on bachelor's degrees, only 500 or so were earned in computer science. So one of the, the key pieces of data that Stephen had introduced is this computer science access report. We have data from every school, every high school, I should say, across the country, and 47% of those are teaching at least one foundational computer science course. So you can see in different states, the numbers vary. Arkansas um, has been brought up there at 89%. Um, to to Stephen's point about definition, I, I believe that our, our colleagues in Arkansas would say that their definition of computer science, 100% of schools are teaching it. Um, but again, this is for comparison purposes. Uh, just to give you an idea of what the definition we use um, is, this is the definition from the Computer Science Teachers Association standards and the K-12 Computer Science Education Framework. Computer science is the study of computers and algorithms, their principles, hardware and software implementation and impact on society. So for the access report, we take that definition to kind of define the core of computer science. It has to be the study of how computers work. Um, it's not just these things, but really all of them and how they work together. We also chose to define it based on applying concepts through programming. So programming or coding have to be part of a course to consider it to be a, a foundational computer science course. These are the courses that we use for our definition in the state of Kansas. We basically look at every state's course code catalog and find the courses that have computer science in the title or programming in the title or just other titles. Generally, we look at all IT courses and select the ones that fit this definition from the previous slide and this slide. So overall, uh, we looked at 363 schools in the state of Kansas. Um, there's a breakdown of kind of how we get those schools. Basically, any school that has at least one high school grade, um, we use the NCES database to uh, determine that list. So here's the data that we have for Kansas for the past two years, 26% of high schools or schools with high school grades, and then 27%. When you look in comparison to other states, uh, Kansas is pretty far below most of the other states, um, you know, the average is 47%, or I guess not the average, the, the nationwide number is 47%, um, and Kansas is, is down there near the bottom. So that uh, is, that correlates to 99 schools um, and 66 districts that are teaching at least one um, foundational computer science course. And um, I do have a spreadsheet with all of those schools, all of those districts, and you know, which percent of the high schools within that district are teaching computer science. So these are the largest districts. It does look like most of these are teaching computer science um, to kind of what Stephen had said earlier. And I believe you also have access to this full spreadsheet. If not, I'll make sure that you all can see so you can look up the school districts across the state and uh, what percent of high schools within that district are teaching one of those courses. Now, um, this isn't all bad news, right? Um, 
in the cities in your state, 73% of high schools are teaching computer science and in the suburbs, 65%. The challenge is really in those rural schools and really it's in those small schools. So I think uh, your challenge and Stephen's challenge, and I'm obviously here to help support as well, is to figure out how do we support those smaller schools to make sure that they are giving their students those opportunities that students in those larger schools, in those cities, in the suburbs have access and opportunities to take. Uh, just wanted to share quickly, I had shared previously the list that we use for computer science. This is the list, the core list uh, that Stephen identified of the core computer science courses that he's looking at for uh, the policies like licensure and graduation requirements. So those are these courses, uh, 95 schools are teaching at least one of those. So you can compare that to the 99 from the slightly longer list that uh, the access report is using for foundational courses. Um, so uh, why does why does this matter? Um, I, I like to tie this back to policy. So there is a connection between the adoption of these policies that support computer science as a foundational core subject area and the percentage of high schools that teach it. This is all 50 states and you can see that there is somewhat of a correlation between the number of policies adopted and uh, the percentage of schools teaching it. Uh, what I also find interesting is that there's not uh, that many school or the states uh, in the bottom right hand corner here. Basically, if you have these policies in place, a lot of the high schools are going to be teaching computer science. There's a strong support for them. But there's also states that are up there in that, that upper quadrant, which shows that these policies don't necessarily guarantee that there's going to be more high schools teaching computer science. Uh, they, they can help support it, but you absolutely don't have to have them in place. And I'll go through some of those nine policies uh, right here. These are all of them and where Kansas stands on them. Um, just to highlight the K-12 computer science or pre-K-12, sorry, computer science standards that were adopted in Kansas are a really great first step. And Stephen, of course, as the CS supervisor is also making sure that these efforts are continuing. Stephen talked about those five recommendations from the task force. Those do align with five of the nine uh, policies on that previous page. I won't go through them again, uh, but just so that you can see kind of what's happening across the country. These are the states uh, plus DC that allow computer science to count as a core graduation credit. Um, Kansas and Connecticut are the only two that don't allow it to apply towards a math, a science. Uh, some also allow it to count towards a practical arts, foreign language, a technology credit. Um, Connecticut is the other one. They also have a recommendation from a task force that they are looking at in terms of how it can count towards graduation. They just haven't put it into policy or issued guidance to districts yet. Um, and then teacher certification, something else that you all are working on. There are 40 states plus DC who currently have a teacher certification in computer science. Some of these require teachers of computer science to have this computer science certification. Most of them do not. So you all also have somewhat of a unique challenge here in that when you have this CS licensure, you'll have to make sure that you're not you know, cutting out your teaching workforce and resulting in fewer computer science classes being taught across the state. Um, it is a challenge. There are other states in that bucket with you. Um, and I'm sure that Stephen will be working with them as well. And then finally, state funding. I know that it's been a really tough year for funding, but we are finding that many of these states that have committed funding in the past, they may have frozen uh, their computer science grant programs back in you know, June, July, August, when they were concerned about their fiscal situation. Most of those states have now unfrozen and restored their computer science funding to previous levels. This varies um, in the states. This is all state uh, money that's been dedicated specifically to computer science. In some states, it's a couple hundred thousand dollars. In some states, it's a couple million. We've been talking about Arkansas, so I'll give them as an example, 2.5 million per year over five years, and they're asking for 3.5 million this year. Uh, Missouri, your neighbor, uh, has 450,000 per year for the past couple of years. So those are kind of the policies I wanted to highlight. I'm happy to answer any other questions you all have. I'm always available by email, katie at code.org. And then you can see all of this data in the report um, at our website here. Uh, and I have several questions uh, and then we'll get on to, the, to my colleagues. Uh, I wanna look at, look at the uh, recommendations and kind of in order. Encourage all schools to offer computer science. What excuses or reasons because if we look at that list, there's a whole lot of rural schools that, that are not 
providing that service? What are the barriers? What are the excuses uh, that's keeping that from happening? And is any of it, I don't want to. It, so, Mr. Chairman, in my experience, it's never been I don't want to. Um, it's always been a couple of things. One is they don't feel like they have existing teaching staff to actually adequately teach a class. And the second part of that is even if they were able to get, um, I, I use one school district, a redesigned school district as an example, they were, they offered, they couldn't offer the, the class because there was no teacher, but they had their IT person set up in the morning to do a drone exercise for students. Again, not a class, but a, an educational experience for the students. But then the question from a district administrative standpoint is, is that sustainable? If, if I get this going this year, can I continue to offer it next year and the year after? And so the question is, are there teachers in the pipeline to support this year over year? And that's the question I hear um, just on a regular basis. Well, I have a couple of districts that probably have less than a dozen or two dozen students in a high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you know, to hire an extra person is probably not going to happen. Has there been any discussion about these school districts that do not have the capability uh, to work with uh, regional groups or service centers or cooperative efforts so that a teacher can perhaps uh, provide services to multiple school districts? Is that an option? Has that been considered and, or should it be considered? It, it is, yes, sir, um, and it is being considered. Um, we've also been looking at some of our some of the service providers, um, the, the curriculum providers who um, can help to train existing teachers. Um, I know that if you look at the people who don't have endorsements for computer studies who are teaching the computer classes at the, at the secondary level, a great many of them are actually business teachers who kind of picked up the computer science stuff on the side, which is, it's a path. Um, hopefully with the endorsement path, we will, we'll, we'll, we'll formalize that. And that's kind of the, the first step in my desire is to formalize the path to get to where you're competent, competent teaching these courses. And I assume most school districts have a business teacher. It's a whole lot more common than, te than computer science teachers. Yeah, yes, yeah. Okay, let's, the next one, computer science should be satisfied. For a requirement. When this first, when we were dealing with the legislature a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. I got into shouting matches with some lobbyists over over the responsibility. By the way, Katie was not one of those. So she mm -hmm. was very reasonable. To, some of the rest of them were not. Uh, you know, and they were pushing the legislature to require, uh, first of all, uh, what I consider our responsibility in determining graduation requirements. And secondly, requiring that everybody have that without understanding that if we did that, it's not, uh, it's not uh, possible because there aren't the people out there. But going to the, to the graduation requirement, I would really like for us to move in that direction. I'd like for a, I, I would like to have a recommendation uh, you know, to, to fulfill that requirement. I think that that's, that's a key issue for two reasons. Number one, is that it it, it uh, keeps that out of the legislature. But more importantly, uh, we've got 2,000 job openings, uh, and it's a, it's a real opportunity through the individual plans of study, if, if that's available, for, uh, for us to provide opportunities for kids to get really well-paying jobs that they're interested in. So I think, I think that's a critical component. And I would like to ask you, what's a reasonable time frame? Now, let me tell you what I think the reasonable time frame is, tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> so, and I know that's not reasonable, but what is reasonable? Um, so the document that we're preparing as a, uh, as, as a guideline for the districts and how they can accept it as a graduation requirement um, I think a reasonable time frame is in, in the next couple of months. Um, for recommendation for actually require, and, and when, okay, first of all, are, are, you, are you suggesting a recommendation in addition to the 21 existing requirements? Or in um, place yeah, of? Well, as, uh, as we in, indicated, I guess 48 states plus the district mm -hmm. uh, have figured out a way to do that. Mm -hmm. You're talking about that they're all different. 
Uh, I think it'd be reasonable. We need a recommendation to make that work. Okay. And uh, and the, I'm and, sorry. And you know, as I said, my my definition of needing it is tomorrow afternoon. You know, right before we adjourn. Mm -hmm. But uh, but uh, you know, this has been this has been a year or so. So you know, mm -hmm. I'm I'm not being critical. I know that it's complicated, and I know that there's a whole lot of balls up in the air. But I, but I think it's critical for us to move in this direction. I say for the two purposes, but the main purpose is that we need to make sure that our students have the opportunity for well-paying jobs mm -hmm. uh, that will sustain them in the middle class and will also meet the needs of the businesses and industry in our area because we have a lot of technology companies in our area, and, we, and so, that's, uh, so that's critical. Can we have a recommendation by May? I can make it happen, yes, sir. Thank you. Let's do this. Yes. Okay. And and. To, and Katie, please clarify, or help me if I'm wrong on this clarification, but the document that we're working on that provides guidance to the districts on how to do this will put us in that 48 states. Correct. Yeah, about half of those states um, we consider to be district decision in which it's not a statewide um, graduation requirement allowance, but instead guidance that the state issues to districts who decide their own graduation requirements. So we would so, put you in that bucket. So we're already moving in that direction. Yes, sir. Okay, that sounds good. Now, the next one, what is the barrier uh, to the licensure endorsement? Time, basically, time and procedure. Um, the, the, the licensure endorsement is always a committee process that gets in, uh, adopted by the board, and, and then we set the guidelines. It's a, it's a fairly longer process than I realized in getting into it. Um, it is working. She had to rebuild the committee um, last month because... Uh, a couple of people have commented on how people, district people are tired right now. The field is, is feeling tired and put upon. Um, so she had several people drop out of the committee. And so she's had it rebuilt. Um, our last meeting was, was almost two dozen people. So I think she's successfully put it back together. Um, and now we just need to finish, finalize the draft basically. And the idea was to finalize the draft by, by, by late March. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I assume, Gene, that that'll be something that's discussed at the Professional Standards Board. So if you'll maybe be our pusher. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, there's several questions. We're probably not going to get to go to lunch today, and that's perfectly all right with me. Uh, Mian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be short. We, as part of the graduation requirements in Kansas, there are six electives mm -hmm. that are required. Can this class be fulfilled? Well, could it fulfill one of the elective? credits already currently mm -hmm. the district could do it absolutely sir uh, but that doesn't count on the lobbyist check mark oh. it has to be has to be a core Naturally. has to be a core not an elective okay good to know thank you dina thank you mr chairman uh, this document that you provided us that says the percentage of schools in a district teaching com computer science. When I look at Salina, where I live, and do some subbing, I know that kids from one school go to the other school for so do you also have some sort of documentation that indicates that the students have access even if the teacher is not residing in their building? Do That's you a know really what good I'm question. I, I wish I did. Um, the data that I've been able to pull is actually out of the CTE database, which tells us which course codes are taught at which building. Um, so, and, and I'm familiar with, with Salina. I've actually visited Salina South and watched. Um, it actually wasn't a teacher from Salina South. It was a teacher from K-State Poly teaching the course. And the teacher was sitting in the course learning programming along with the students. And it was, I thought, a wonderful example of how, <coughs> how we can skill up our teachers 
um, except for when I asked who was paying the, the K-State Poly professor, and it turns out he was doing it for free. Um, but all that being said, I, I know that it is happening. I've seen it happen, um, but I don't have that data. I can try and okay. find a way to get it. Well, I know they do that with just about every <coughs> pathway. They aren't offering it in each school. Mm -hmm. They've because they do pull in the experts from the field to be teaching, so that provides them that opportunity to only be dealing with one, having to deal with one building instead of traveling all over town. So, and they've done a pretty good job of offering some of the, the pathways in one location and others in the other location. So it's about evenly distributed. But I just wondered if, because it makes Salina, for example, and I'm sure other schools or other districts that similar things occur that makes them look like they keep computer science from a certain population of students. And I'm just thinking that when this, if this information goes across the street, it makes it look to a legislator like half of the students don't have access, which may not be true. So just, just a, a thought. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And to follow up on that, you know, if, if we if we put put two of the two schools in my district that I was talking about that have probably less than a dozen kids in high school and Wichita in a pile, we'd say that a third, only a third of the schools have. Whereas we, if you count the students, it's it's a huge difference. Okay, thank you, uh, Janet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm very interested in this. My daughter is a business teacher, and she currently teaches at a middle school. And uh, she did go to a coding class, and she teaches coding in the middle school. And uh, my concern, though, is, is licensure, you know, because she doesn't have, there's no uh, added license for her, her, for her license. I'm wondering about uh, micro-credentialing. Uh, I understand there are some out there in various groups. I know the NEA offers some, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so uh, what about that? <clears throat> That's, uh, and, and I can agree, I, Katie can probably speak a little bit more specifically on which states are looking at micro-credentialing. Um, I know that our TLA department as a whole has been looking at adopting micro-credentialing overall, um, and uh, so, Basically, I've, I've been looking, we, we've been going the standard um, endorsement route with the idea that it, once they get micro-credentialing figured out, then that should also apply to computer science. Okay, well, I support, yeah, I definitely support this. So I'm, I'm very, I would encourage, I, this, this is too, so important to our kids today. Thank you. There are a handful of states that are considering micro-credentials and there are folks who are developing computer science teacher micro-credentials. They might already be developed or close to being developed at this point. So this would be a really great space for Kansas to take a lead on. Thank you. And our last question is from Melanie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm afraid I'm gonna kind of take us off course because I have a background in technology and I did not go to school for any of it. Um, I don't have a computer science degree, but I am a self-taught coder. Mm -hmm. And so I guess as you talked about tying this to a math requirement, red flags appeared for me because if you had tied it to math for me when I was in high school, I'm not sure that, you know, I couldn't have gravitated, gravitated to that. Um, I was told that I was bad at math. And so that's why I chose not to become an architect, for instance. And so I think that you have students who are making decisions at this time in their life when I consider these types of computing skills to be integral to simply being part of our modern society. Sorry, I'm going to soapbox here for just a minute. Please bear with me because I, I'll have a lot of questions for you after and I, I don't want to keep everyone. 
Um, but, you know, we have kids who should also know how to use a power saw, or at the very least, a drill or a screwdriver. And I've heard from students who say that they don't know how to make macaroni and cheese, which I'm not sure that I believe, but, you know, there are lots of life skills when we talk about things that we want our students to graduate with. And, and to me, this is a life skill. So I, I have a lot of questions about how this gets tied to math and then how the decisions are made regarding what all kids get versus what just some kids get. Um, so I'd, I'd like to pick your brain on that a little bit more, um, but I, I do want to say that I have concerns too about where the funding is going to come from because right now we're at a place where we're not even fully funding SPED. And so I, I'm very curious to hear more about the formula for how this fits into all of those overarching graduation requirements. And to Ben's point about, you know, if you're asking a student to take this as an elective, mm -hmm. um, you know, where, where those numbers are going to come from to add mm -hmm. up to graduation. So sorry, sorry to kind of throw all of that at you, um, but it's a lot to digest from, uh, <laughs> from, from Katie's comments and from your comments in the mm -hmm. PowerPoints. We're seeing this for the first time, and so I haven't had a chance to really read through all of it and, and have some questions set up, but that's just kind of where my head is right now, given that this is my background. So feel free to respond to any or none of that, and we can catch up. Thank you. Thank yes, you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, from the funding point of view, I think that we need to make sure that whenever we do our budget request in the future that we make sure that that's part of our consideration. I realized, uh, Stephen, that uh, whenever I was asking my questions, I kind of you know, I self-reflect all the time. I'm passionate about this, and I may have come across as rude. That was not my intention. Uh, and if I did, I apologize for that. So Thank you. Thank you. That being uh, said, uh, we are in recess until, thank you, Katie. We are in recess until uh, 1.30.
would welcome the vice chair back at her convenience. I'm accustomed to hearing excuses, so that's okay. This is one of the, uh, we are called back to order. This is one of those uh, exciting times where we get to honor students. So, Mark, it's all yours. I'm Mark Thompson. I'm the Education Program Consultant for Health and Physical Education here at KSDE. In addition, I serve as the Project Director for the KSDE Annual Conference. It is my privilege to recognize the student winners of the 2020 uh, KSDE Conference Art, Art Design Contest. I must extend a sincere thank you to Teresa Cody, who coordinates this contest each year and always does a great job with it. The theme for the conference was Kansans Can Soar. And as you will see by the students' art, they were exceptional in depicting this theme. From approximately 120 entries, which was down from what we typically have, because this uh, was, was sent out post-pandemic uh, post uh, start, uh, the, out of 120 entries, finalists were narrowed down for each of the three categories, elementary, middle school, and high school. From these finalists, the winners were selected. We have the pleasure of recognizing those winners today. Each of the winners received a, th a frame with their artwork and a certificate mounted for them to have and to display. In addition, each received monetary awards with the third place winner receiving $50, second place $75, and the first place winner receiving $125. Without further ado, I'll re now recognize the winners. As I proceed through the winners, we're asking each of them to stay on Zoom, although we'll just be pulling one up at a time until the end so we can get a screenshot of all of them at once. So, um, I, uh, um, Eric, if we can show, uh, well, actually, I'm, I'm kind of in control of, maybe I'm not. <laughs> uh, this, uh, Jade Willard, uh, which is the, um, you can see the camera on the screen that is the classroom of Jade Willard. Um, Third place winner, Jade Willard from Sunflower Elementary School in Paola. Jade was in third grade and is now a fourth grader. Her teacher is Emily Alphen. Her principal is Stacy Wokuch, and the superintendent is Matt Meek. Her artwork dep depicts sunflowers and a hot air balloon displaying a rendition of the Kansas State flag as the balloon is positioned over the American flag. So would like to say a hearty congratulations to Jade. Okay, we'll move on to the second place winner. Second place, and I'll wait for Eric to pull up Annabelle. This is kind of one of those things where you wish you had an opportunity to rehearse it. Ah, there we go. Uh, so Annabelle Storr uh, is the second place winner she, of Storr Christian Academy in, in Inman. Annabelle was a ninth grade student, eighth grade student and is now in 10th grade. Her teacher is Katie Storr. Annabelle's artwork depicts a bird, which I think looks like a meadowlark. Soaring with wings open wide with a sunflower and a nighttime farm scene with trees, a barn, a house, and a pickup, all illuminated under a moonlit sky. Just a beautiful depiction. Annabelle, congratulations to you. Okay, now we'll move to the first place winner. And I'll wait for Eric to transition. All right. 
Um, so the first place winner is Nadia Kausai of Andover Middle School in Andover. Nadia was a second in seventh grade and is now an eighth grader. Her teacher is Ms. Smith. Her principal is Deb Regeer, and the superintendent is Brett White. Nadia's artwork has a beautiful metal arc bursting through a poster of sunflowers while carrying the Kansas flag. The opening in the poster reveals a yellow brick road extending through rolling green hills, a tornado, and an aircraft soaring through a blue sky with wispy white clouds, brilliantly capturing the conference theme, Kansans Can Soar. Congratulations, Nadia. So Eric, if you wouldn't mind pulling all of the, them up as well as their uh, supporting crew. What's that? Oh. Wow, okay. <laughs> so, uh, for those that are remaining, congratulations. Congratulations to all the winners. Um, and um, uh, Chairman Porter, uh, board members, Dr. Watson, uh, if you would like, I don't know if you want to um, uh, say anything, have a comment, ask questions. We, we don't know what their, their audio feed is like, but uh, we're, we're rolling as we go. Well, first of all, we want to congratulate you on a job. Very well done. Normally, we would be at a conference, and we would get to congratulate you in person, and so we're sorry we can't do that, but uh, these are amazing. Uh, you're very, very talented people, and we really appreciate uh, uh, your efforts and admire your talent and your willingness to participate. So I want to thank you. I want to tell you how proud we are of you and uh, keep up the good work. Uh, any other board members have comments? Well, let's give them another round of applause. Um, now go back to school. Um, <laughs> A Annabelle, can you give me a thumbs up if that was a meadow lark? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, to all the winners, their teachers, administrators, and parents, congratulations, and thank you for taking the time to meet with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I've been wanting to say this for two years. We're going to act on professional standards board recommendation for micro-credentials for licensed educators. Michelle, and my maybe good friend Eric, years. I think I'll bring up that. Thank you, Chairman Porter. Presentation. I wanted to come in early to get to watch that. That's always so much fun. Okay, practice my patience here. I don't have a lot of that. I, yeah, I'm the worst, so. Okay, thank you, Eric, I appreciate that, thank you. 
Good afternoon, members of the board, Chairman Porter, Commissioner Watson. Thank you for this opportunity. As Chairman Porter said, this is, this is one of those times I, I'm not bringing children with me, so I uh, really appreciate that chance to get to see that artwork. Ama amazing things done by our Kansas kids. But this is exciting for Kansas educators as well. So if I might be able to just remind you um, a little bit about this, this process. M most of this is, as Chairman Porter said, not new to you but where we want to uh, keep our teachers and keep learning for our professional, professional educators is that we're creating an opportunity for personalized professional de development that does more for teachers and not just being seen as one thing more for them to do. The definition that we are asking for your support on today, uh, you have documents about this as well. We presented those to you last month and we're, we're back this year, that the micro-credential is a personalized, professional unit of study, it's competency-based, and results in a credential. And it can be used at the local level both for formal and informal professional learning experiences. I might just uh, uh, remember Clifford and I had a conversation just right before and in relation to your computer science work prior to your lunch break. I, I want to make sure that, that this is clear. In, in no way is the micro-credential at this point intended to take away the endorsement work that teachers do to add their, to their teacher licenses. That's not what this would be about, that those folks that go through the process for endorsement, uh, to use uh, Chairman Clifford's words, we don't want to take, a, take that away from them or from higher ed. That, that's a different level of work too. But this gives an opportunity for educators to really personalize where they are in their professional learning pathway. And uh, I appreciate the work that the members of the Standards Board, uh, Chairman Porter, others have, have contributed as well. And I have Susan with me behind me as Assistant Director so that she, if there are other questions, she's, she's here to help answer those as well. We laid out for you all the components. Uh, th this was a, a really great uh, joined process with members of the Standards Board, myself, higher ed, to really come up with the language on here that was helpful for educators and help our current professional development councils be able to begin to implement this process. So I did also include for you a possible motion so that it was clear what it was that we were asking for. Again, just an opportunity. We have some folks in the field who are already using this for their professional educators, and we want to be able to give a nice, good blessing from you all that they might move forward in that process. At the same time, we realize, too, that our regulations around professional learning for educators uh, need to be updated, and we've got uh, some things in place to begin that process as well. So with that, I will uh, stop and answer any questions you all may have. Ben. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm very excited. I chair the chair's um, excitement for this. I think it's a great way forward. And, uh, and professional development, which is this is what it's addressing, is professional development of our teachers. They become the students again in that mode. If we expect our students to have an individualized plan of study, this fits right in with our vision. And I wholeheartedly believe that this is an individual plan of study for our teachers' education. And I'm, I applaud it. So because of that, I move that the Kansas State Board of Education endorse educator micro-credentials at the local level as a viable option for individualized, personalized professional learning to improve instruction in Kansas. Is there a second? Jim McNeese seconds that motion. Any further discussion? I'm going to ask a clarifying question. Mm -hmm. Does that cover it? The motion that you, the suggested motion there is different from what we have on our packet. Which one of them is the? This one. The one that Ben made? Or the one that's on the, on the How screen? are they different, Chair? I'm sorry. This one, please. Uh, can I'm, you modify your motion? I amend my motion <laughs> to can approve you the definition. Your second? <laughs> so, okay. so may I ask a clarifying question? Uh, apologies, I think I might have gotten my PowerPoint in and then and made a change. This one, thank you. Thank you for giving me that moment. This one. I'm in mind to what's on the screen. <laughs> Any discussion? Okay, Ben, any more? Uh, Ann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Michelle, are, are school districts, do you think there would are they amenable to allowing some of their professional development time that they allow during the school year to be used for this so teachers really can 
individualize their learning rather than have to sit through, you know, whatever the district had planned for a day? I think this will give them an opportunity to be more amiable to that. I, um, I, I do know there have been systems, I've been out two and a half years, even, even that long ago, that were doing some of this already. And the conversation we had with a particular school system that was dipping their toe deeper into this really was waiting for this before they opened up those floodgates a little bit to, um, to, to your point, give time in a school calendar and in a school uh, opportunity to really use that for, for these singular purposes so that every day isn't pre-planned. It can right. be an opportunity for teachers to use it for their individualized plans. So we have a communications plan to get the word out about how that is something we'd like to see. So we will get the word out so that people can be, be given that freedom over time. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, again, I remain cautious that the regs aren't quite ready yet and that we have work to do there. But this gives the system already an opportunity that they can begin this work. And we will, through curriculum leaders, other opportunities as well, communicate to the field that we have done this and what that means for them as a system. Okay, and if I could have one more. I guess somehow I thought you could use micro-credentials towards your renewal of your license. Y yes, you can, absolutely okay, for the renewal you of your license because you'll still track points the same way at the local level. Mm -hmm. You'll have those knowledge level points, you'll have impact and you'll have application points, right? So you'll get those at varying levels. This allows an opportunity for a teacher to do more than just learn about a skill. It gives them the freedom to uh, get more points because they've used it in an application setting. If you look at the components that we have laid out, we've attached that to their current system, allowing them and to, to build up that learning, attach it to their professional development transcript for renewal. Okay. So you're absolutely right. Thank you, because I yes. was afraid from what you said before that it wouldn't count toward renewal, but. No, it won't, it won't count toward an endorsement. Toward, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So difference between renewal and endorsement. Thank you for Thank asking you. those clarifying questions. And to follow up, Ann, on, on my years on the Professional Standards Board, this came up numerous times, and that teachers had been having discussions with their, with their administrators and with their boards about micro-credentialing, and they're actually waiting for us to say it's okay. Mm -hmm. And so, so some of that's already in line, and I've talked to administrators who are just uh, very excited about not, as Michelle and I both talked about, we've, we've planned things that we hated yeah. uh, so that we can use that time more productively. So I think that, that, uh, that at least there are numerous places that are just waiting for us to say this is okay uh, officially and then move forward. And I hope that uh, I've even underestimated that. Seeing no other questions, all in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. All opposed, the motion carries. Thank you very much. And if I believe that uh, our next presenter will be Michelle. Yes, we are so I'm about, looking. Uh, okay, recommendations to upgrade the accreditation <laughs> of St. Patrick's Elementary School. Am I doing okay, Eric? I'll, I'll just stop again. My impatience gets the best of me. Apologies. Thank you. Don't you. Have to apologize to me for being impatient. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yep. Thank you again, members of the board. I have Jeanette with me to ask questions as we go through this opportunity to share with you how the Accreditation Review Council changes a status for a system. This particular system that we are bringing you today has asked for a change in status. So if I could back up a little bit and just uh, review with you a little bit about the process, especially for our new members. Accreditation currently is a five-year process of improvement that is married to compliance. Currently, we allow for an outside visitation member to come in and offer a constructive partnership opportunity for that school system to review their continuous improvement opportunities. Each school system is responsible for completing a yearly report and to engage in that outside visitation team conversation and the chair completes a report as well. So in the end, the accreditation process as it stands now is a five-year process 
that includes the system articulating how they are in a process, method, and way attending to student achievement for students and what their results look like, those two things together. Currently, I say that because there could be some changes in this process over time, but currently every five years, the system comes before the Accreditation Review Council in which they review that process, they review those results, they write a summary, and they make a recommendation to you all. Those recommendations that they choose from, there are three. One is accredited, they're in good standing in compliance, and they have shown that they have a process in place that is intentional and allows for a quality growth process for their students. Conditionally accredited, this means the system is still in good standing, but that they had some issue on either process or uh, in the results area of student performance, and that the ARC felt like they needed to provide a little bit more intentionality in a specific area, could be more than one. Not accredited means that they've got issues in both uh, compliance and in their evidence of a growth process for student performance, and they were not able to conclusively provide evidence uh, relating these to the, to the ARC. So in our process that we have developed, again, this is the first time for you all to make an offer of, uh, to accept the offer of changing the status. So if they've been given that conditionally accredited status, we notify them, the system. They have 15 days to make their appeal and say, we want to work on this. We, we disagree, we want to work on it, and we would like the 30 to 45 days to allow you and the system to prove that they have a process in place. We give them that opportunity. This is for conditionally accredited or not accredited systems. When that is complete, the new recommendation uh, is made to the state board. The ARC chimes in and says, yes, they did, or no, they did not. So the first month, we present the system to you all for review, and then the second month, uh, as your processes allow, we, we ask for action. So this system is, uh, has been awarded a conditionally accredited status. They have gone through their areas for improvement. They have proven to the ARC that they need to, uh, they, they're asking for a change in status. They've met the task, they've met the timelines, et cetera, and they've submitted that information to us at KSDE. So the ARC has reviewed the information. They make a recommendation as to whether or not they agree with that change of status and then you all are involved with the process and that's where we find ourselves today. St. Patrick's has said, we know what we needed to do and we feel that we have done that and I'm actually gonna let Jeanette step in for a moment and talk with you specifically about this particular, uh, the work that this, this school has done for the ARC. Thank you, Michelle. Good morning, board. Good afternoon, isn't it? Okay, yeah. That tells you what my day's been like. <laughs> That's right. Um, glad to be here. Let me talk to you a little bit about St. Patrick Elementary. They came into KISA uh, in a year three process, which means if you, many of you may recall, and for those that are new, we brought in systems in a staggered approach, meaning they could choose which year they wanted to enter the KISA process. Because St. Patrick Elementary was also doing a joint process with Cognia, which is a regional accreditation agency, and they were already a year three with them, they decided to come in KISA as a year three. So their accreditation year then was in 2019 and 2020. When they were reviewed by the ARC at that point in time, they were given a recommendation of conditionally accredited, and they went through the appeal process. When they went through the appeal process, at that time, the ARC found three areas of improvement for them. Uh, through the appeal process, they were able to satisfy two of those, and then one of them they were not. So they were then brought to you as a state board in September for a conditional accreditation. You reviewed them, and in October, then you took action to approve and grant that conditional accreditation. I went ahead of myself, okay. So of the three areas for improvement that they had, 
Uh, one of them was systemic use of data to support foundational structures. The other one was about resource capacity for long-term sustainability. And the last one was implementation of an individual plan of study. Like I said, they satisfied during their appeal, both the first with regard to the foundational structures and support, and then of resource capacity for long-term sustainability. What they did not or were not able to prove at that point in time was that they did have an implementation plan for their individual plan of study. So they have worked on those areas and in January, they provided us with documentation for their individual plan of study and brought information to, this, to the ARC with regard of that. Now, uh, when they give information, they do it via our KISA application, and so they upload artifacts to be able to substantiate the work that they're doing. And so that's what the ARC takes a look at, that documentation. According to the Accreditation Review Council, as they reviewed the documentation, they did find that there was an IPS now in place, that there was evidence of implementation, and that the implementation that they saw was that it has been going on for now three months and that there has been progress being made. So they felt fairly comfortable with saying that they would like to bring that to you as a state board for action and removing them from conditionally accredited to an accredited status. Questions? Ben. No, Janet. I'm Thank just you. accustomed to calling on you. <laughs> See? I can speak to you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is the district, am I, am I remembering correctly? that had a lot of challenges through, they had a lot of changes in administration, is that correct? That uh, they, the, um, yes, their principal was fairly new, um, yes. had been there only one year. That's what I thought, you know, so anyway, well, uh, can I go ahead and make the motion? You may. Okay, uh, I would move that the Kansas State Board of Education accept the recommendation to change the accreditation status of St. Patrick Elementary from conditionally accredited to accredited and, and commend them on making the changes that, ne are, that were necessary. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? Jim McNeese seconds that motion. Further discussion, Jim. Thank you, Chairman Porter. Uh, Jeanette, thanks. Hi. This is good. Thank you. You know, when you consider, um, how many years ago was it when we started <laughs> Wasn't I don't, It was before my time. What's that? It was before my time well, with no, Kisa. We renewed it, we, you know. <laughs> I thought you came um, the building. <laughs> one of the big issues in the accreditation before Kesa, at, at, as we have it today, was the fact that everybody just got accredited. Mm -hmm. You know, you showed up, you did your deal, you know, and then they found a way to massage it and send it in, and everybody was, you know, accredited. And one of the things, especially in the legislature and out in the communities, was the fact that people had concerns and issues that you guys just rubber stamp it. Mm -hmm. And so far, we've seen we're not just rubber stamping them. We're challenging people to be better. You know, and I have to say that uh, I'm <clears throat> personally really pleased that I can say that, you know, we're holding people's feet to the fire and, and um, we're not just rolling over and letting them be accredited without meeting our standards. And I want to appreciate the work that you guys are doing to do that because it's pretty hard to go back to a school and say you're, you're conditionally accredited, or you know yeah. what, you might not get any. You know, mm -hmm. that, those are tough conversations. And I applaud St. Patrick's for taking the high road and going after it the way they have and, and meeting the, the credentials, you know, to be accredited. So it's a win-win situation for all. And, uh, but I appreciate your leadership in doing this, and I realize the tough job that you have in making that happen, so thank you. Thank you. And as much as it hurts me, I'm going to publicly agree with Jim. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This is, you know, there has been criticism that we had not been holding people's feet to the fire. And I anticipate, based on some observations I've made, that we may be dealing with these sorts of issues again. That's correct. We're going to vote, and I have a question that's sort not related to St. Pat, but related to the process. Okay. All in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. 
All opposed? We have conditionally accredited a few schools already. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know whether or not any of the others are in the process of coming back to us for change? Yes. Um, so if you may recall, when the areas for improvement are stipulated, they are given a timeline in terms of when they're supposed to have this information back. And the timeline really depends upon the type of work that they need to do. So at this point in time, in April, we're supposed to have um, one district coming back. And then in May, we have another district coming back. So I would probably say between May and June, probably you'll be receiving two additional changes if the ARC agrees yeah, sure. with, with the recommendation. Okay, thank you very much. And now we're gonna receive preliminary information regarding system pause from Kisa, and I believe we have the same two people. Uh, I'm back up this time. <laughs> All right, now, Eric. On my list, it says Jeanette first. So. <laughs> I'll be patient, Eric, and let you. You're having multiple opportunities to practice patience today, Michelle. Every day, Chairman Porter. Um, that's not the. That's not the one. I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thanks. Thank you, Eric. Wow, thank you so much. So, Chairman Porter, members of the board, Commissioner Watson, thank you. If you, let me take you back just a little bit to uh, sort of when we found ourselves in this opportunity of, of learning with a, a worldwide pandemic. So in October of 2020, you all approved public and private systems to have a choice of pausing their accreditation year and just taking a deep breath and uh, really trying to recognize the difficulty of the situation. So the state board at that time said, uh, we'll give you this one year opportunity and directed KESA staff to have systems uh, report out to you on their academic and their social emotional progress. So we have taken a uh, snapshot in January of that opportunity. We'll provide you with final findings in July, uh, a final report to you all. These are the types of things underneath academic and the social emotional needs that we are going to be asking those systems. We've collectively run these questions by. We have until April 1st to finalize them. We're really trying to look at the academic and the social emotional as you directed and, and uh, find a good way of reporting that back to you. And, and we're, we're really close. We've asked for staff input. Dr. Watson gave us some input on these questions as well. Preliminarily, as I said, we started uh, with a, a large conversation in January on a monthly normal update, and we asked the 280 folks that were participating with us across the state to answer some questions for us. Uh, specifically related to why did you pause? Why didn't you pause? Tell us about your local assessment measures. Remember, there were no state assessments uh, in 2020. So this gave them an opportunity to really think about that piece too. And how were you measuring your social emotional concerns, not just for your students, but for your staff as well. And to also talk a little bit with us about the evidence-based programs that they were using. So for example, what prompted your decision? We heard responses such as lessen the burden on our staff, focus on the needs at hand of dealing with the pandemic. We've had a plethora of staffing changes and we really need to go back and give more thought and conversation to our data. The not pausing themes were maintain momentum. We did have several who said, no, thank you. We're fine, we're going to keep moving forward to maintain our continuous improvement momentum. Uh, in person, a lot of these systems were in person, so they really didn't see a need to pause. And they just felt like in, in the cycle, they were it was advantageous for them to keep moving forward. Preliminarily, pre preliminary findings on the academic area questions. What were your data sources? It was amazing to me when we, uh, last spring and there were no state assessments, I, I had to pull some folks down, down out of the, out of the, off the cliff. It's okay, you've got local data, I know you do, so you'll be all right. 
So we asked them, what's that data telling you? And then what are you using? And these were our findings. Some of these things you heard Dr. Watson mention this morning as ways of measuring uh, data in the district. These are their academic pieces. ASQ, uh, FastBridge, map testing, uh, you have uh, Pathways, you have AmesWeb, Dibbles, et cetera. These are some of the data sources that were reported back to us. This data is split out by elementary, middle, and high school students, and we were curious about what data at these levels, what was the data telling you? Have you had that change? Have you had a loss? Have you had an overall decline? Where are you? Interestingly enough, the majority of the respondents said we've had some improvements and we've had some declines. And I appreciate the honesty of folks who said this was January, we've not yet gotten to that data piece yet. <coughs> Preliminary findings on the social emotional piece. I, I, I so appreciate the board's effort to not just recognize uh, the work we need to continue to do with students, but the, that our teachers as well have had challenging social emotional uh, opportunities throughout this last year as well. So we ask how they were addressing those needs of staff and students. Tell us about the data. And then what is that data telling you? Again, divide it out on elementary, middle, and high. Has your system addressed the needs? Most, the majority of them said yes, yes we have. And there are a few folks who said no, we, we've not taken that opportunity yet. And we divided it out into we've embedded it, we use an evidence-based curriculum, and then we also do our best to assess the culture and climate factors and the social emotional well-being of our staff and students. Which evidence-based curriculum are you using? You can see here that a lot of folks in the field are using second step. And this was just of those folks who were available to us in January. How are you addressing with your staff? There are some really nice ideas here for morale enhancers, dress down days, treats, uh, some paid time off, et cetera. Uh, locally developed staff climate surveys, mental health newsletters, self-care strategies, community opportunities, ways to engage your community in the conversation as well. So what data are you collecting to find out if you have effective interventions and supports? You can see here again that uh, several different places that they're using assessments from evidence-based curriculums, locally developed, because we said in the area of social emotional supports that could be something that was created locally. Folks are choosing to use the Kansas Communities That Care survey, and there are others that are becoming available as well. So in general, what is the data telling you about the social emotional growth in light of the pandemic? And, and I think the findings here are, are not not too surprising. Uh, some have shown an overall improvement. Some would say there have been improvements and there have been declines. We wanted to give them an opportunity to answer in that way. Elementary, middle, and high again. So here's what you need to do, know today moving forward. We will ask every system who paused, we will tell them they have to complete the survey. Because you paused, this survey needs to be completed by you. We want to add a little bit more to the survey to get some open-ended ideas on short and long-term plans for the future moving forward out of the pandemic. Uh, how can you integrate everything you've done within, within your improvement process? Please be sure we want them to look at the data collected by subgroups, content areas, and our turnaround is, is pretty short. I want to be able to get this back to you. I asked Jeanette the other day, why did we say July? What if the board wants it sooner? Well, sometimes we know when we put a due date, April 22nd, we still have to beat the bushes to get a few more of those responses gathered and collected. So uh, they are to, the survey will be released to the field. It will go out to superintendents April 1st, and we've asked for a turnaround by April 22nd. We will gather, analyze, culminate, et cetera, and bring that data back to you all. Again, this is a requirement for any of the systems who chose to pause. And with that, Chairman, I am happy to stand for questions. Okay, do we have questions? Give me just a second. 
Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Michelle, I'm trying to figure out um, since since many of them paused. Uh -huh. Are we? Are you? They they said no. We're gonna we're gonna pause. Or we're gonna take that time. So, are, are we looking? I'm trying to figure out the data here. Are we? The data that you're going to come back to us possibly in July is going to be va basically from right now till 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 July or yep. till the end of June. Because if, if we had you're showing data should be from only the ones that didn't pause. That's so so this data for us to get a, an idea what the survey was going to look like, this is pause and no, not pause systems right now. We're showing you a January sna a snapshot from both. When we open in, uh, on April 1st, it will only be systems who pause that we will bring data back to you from. And we'll ask them to reflect in this whole entire year, this year of, of 2021. Do you think the data, I mean, if they, if they pause, they might not have been paying attention to some of, some of the things that they thought, you know, because they had so much going on. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious what will what reports, um, will they be valid or useful to right. us? Right, and that was, that was part of the reason why we did that in January, too, was to create that idea of, remember, the state board asked for you to attend to these two things. They gifted you the pause, but they asked you to continue to attend to academic and social-emotional. Mm -hmm. So it was a lovely opportunity in January after the holidays, et cetera, to bring it to them and say, don't forget, this this should be on your radar. So more accurate information probably will come up out in, in July for us. Yes. Okay, thank you. And again, of just those systems who paused. Okay. And Thank you, Mr. Chair. Michelle, how long do you think it'll be before we get a school that's conditionally accredited because they didn't do the social-emotional stuff they were supposed to do? <laughs> this year? <laughs> it, 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 um, mm. I, yes, I, it, it will happen. It will happen from a system who, because the key piece there is show me a piece of evidence, not just a yes, we did this, mm -hmm. but what evidence piece to, to the previous question, what do you have that you're looking at that really tells you whether or not you're moving in a positive direction in that area? And a lot of places when we gave that to them as a local control opportunity, put that on the back burner till we stand and say, you, you must do this now. So it will happen based on that one particular issue, I believe, Ann. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Well, I, believe, I see no other questions, so. What's your next presentation? <laughs> this would be Kansas City Teacher Residency, and I have um, some guests that may be in the hallway. Let me. Well, we're quite a bit ahead of schedule. Okay, so. good. Thank you, Eric. So do you have five more presentations? Or? No, I believe this is my last one. <laughs> Thank you for your kindness while I'm in front of you. Hi. Hello. Welcome. How are you? I am well. Wonderful. Do you have Dr. King with you? He is parking. He's parking. Yes. Okay. Would you like to? I believe I can. <laughs> I believe I am. Okay, I think um, you probably are. Good to see you. Uh, chairman, members of the board, thank you for this opportunity to bring back the Kansas City Teacher Residency Program to you. Remember, we were looking for a viable pilot opportunity from the pilots that we ran previously for the elementary folks were not as successful as we had hoped they would be. And so I wanted to present this opportunity to you as a, a possible route for our elementary classroom teachers. Just as a, a piece of bringing you back to this, this is a lengthy residency partnership opportunity and uh, two guests with you. Dr. King is obviously parking the car. Andrew is here and I think he can follow through with this. You're just gonna use right here, Andrew. I know you know what you're doing. And then be more than happy to answer any questions that you all have about that. Absolutely. I'll watch for him too. Of course, thank you. Um, Andrew. Good afternoon. Um, thank you all so much again for your time. It is, of course, an honor to, to get the opportunity to chat with you, to again make the case, I hope, as we did last time, for the opportunity to partner uh, with the great state of Kansas. Uh, myself and Charles are residents here. We, we love the state. We are looking for an opportunity to do work here. And we believe that this offers an opportunity to address one of the most dire needs that every state has, but in particular the state of Kansas has, as does every other state, uh, which is the need for human capital, the need for qualified, effective, um, dedicated and long-term teaching staff within schools throughout Kansas. In the initial phase, the initial conversations are going to focus on parts of the state that are located farther towards the east, 
predominantly because that is the context with which we're the most familiar. However, as we've shared last week, and as I'll have probably answer a question about again today, um, we are not opposed to the opportunity and the possibility of expanding westward should this prove a successful partnership. So I am, I can talk you through these slide decks. I can move pretty quickly to talk about um, the questions that y'all might have. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of touch on a couple of key pieces here, um, which is that from a standpoint of return on investment, this slide here is where I want to uh, focus attention very quickly, which is that, mostly because it's not something we talked about last time. So one of the elements that we think about when we look at uh, the opportunities that exist for the partners that we work with is whether or not, number one, our program is producing the teaching talent that we claim to, and number two, are those individuals actually successfully getting hired? So not only are they finishing our program, getting certified, but they're actually going into positions. And the other component that's listed out here as well is, are we doing one of the core elements of our mission, which is creating a more diverse teaching pool? So in the state of Missouri, one of the priorities that the state asked us to focus on when we started entering into partnership was to focus on increasing the number of men in the classroom and the number of individuals that identify as people of color in the classroom. And so those were priorities for us as an organization. And so not only are we producing teaching talent for our school partners, but we're also producing a more diverse set of individuals in the classroom. Um, I hope that this, I, this idea resonates already, but representation can make a big difference for kids. I don't know about the rest of you, but when I was in school, I had a very limited number of, of teachers that were men. If there were, there were oftentimes coaches, one or two of them. And there are a number of issues that young men need to have addressed and have the opportunity to discuss with an adult that if they don't have male teachers, they may not have the opportunity to do so. We know that the same idea holds true for individuals that identify as people of color. There's a unique set of opportunities and a unique set of challenges that exist for all different identities. And having that identity in front of you on a daily basis can make a big difference. This is just something that we sort of focus on as an organization that we're successful in accomplishing. The biggest thing here, is that this is the data that we put in front of district partners when we offer ourselves up as a partner in, in pursuit of human capital, which is that we are able to produce the teaching talent that we claim we're able to produce. So we're not just saying, hey, give us a couple of dollars and we'll go out and try to make this happen. The, the claim that we're going to make is that you're going to afford us a teaching a fee for the resident placement process, and we're ultimately going to produce someone that's going to be hired into your district and stay. Uh, that longevity is a key component of our program. So the last thing I just want to touch on is, and I know we, we had the opportunity to talk a few weeks ago, um, so I won't belabor these things, but, but I do want to stress when we think about, um, and again, this partnership fee that we're discussing here is not something that we're asking the state to subsidize. This is something that we ask our partners within discrete districts to provide. Uh, but we specifically spend the finances that we do take in on recruitment, coaching, development, as well as providing a network for our participants. And these are components that we believe are critical in ensuring that we're able to produce talent and that we're able to retain talent, uh, specifically thinking about the coaching and development elements here. Um, so these are just a couple of quick, discrete ideas that I wanted to lift up for us. So I want to open the floor for any questions that this body might have, and I will do my best to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to um, make sure I had this straight. Um, on your program, the students do have to do some classwork and some student teaching before they go before a class? Yeah, so the part of what makes our program unique in that respect is, is what we call a long runway. So when residents enter into our program, they spend the first year with us as essentially a student teacher. We, we call them a resident. But they spend that year training, developing, and working in a classroom under the mentorship of a veteran teacher, minimum three years of experience, and someone that our team has vetted. When they complete that first year, then they're certified, at which point they would move into a teacher of record position. So this is not a program that's going to produce a certified teacher immediately. We believe that that long runway, that full year of training and development, is the difference between that person being effective during their first year as a lead teacher but also we believe that it's critical to preventing the development of bad habits, which then in turn can be a retention challenge on down the line. Right, and then uh, the only other one was um, 
the amount of college hours that were required. Are they required to get a master's or just take a certain number of hours? So they're required to have a bachelor's when they enter into the right. program. The way that the program is structured currently with our partnership with UMKC is that if you enroll with us, you're automatically enrolled at UMKC. And so they're required to finish that graduate degree as part of our programming. In two years? That's correct. So the okay. first half during the residency year, the second half while they're teacher of record. And you expect to expand that beyond um, the University of Missouri to other Kansas universities? Yes, absolutely. Something we've discussed. We have some relationship with a couple of universities on the Kansas side. It hasn't made sense to date for us to expand and talk to a, a Kansas university partner. Uh, moving forward, it absolutely makes sense for us to do so in order to ensure that our residents who are working in Kansas are, are getting certified by okay. university and here in the state. Just one more, and it's a uh, master's in education. Is that, that is what correct. they get? Okay. Yeah, curriculum and instructional leadership. Very good. Thank you. Thank of course. Absolutely. Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to make a comment. I have a junior son in Kansas um, school system, and he has only one female teacher. Mm, interesting. So, so he, that is a yeah, he has a, he's stark a, contrast. Yes. He's a, I think both years he's mostly had male teachers. So that's awesome. And that's at the high school level. Yeah. It can definitely, it definitely varies by site. Um, well, that's I think, a concern, too, as far as our, is there a shortage in certain areas as yeah. demographics and all that. So I think what I would say is that. Um, Again, the reason our focus is on the areas that it's focused on from a demographic standpoint is because that's what we knew there was a shortage for in the state of Kansas. Our current partners in Missouri, or sorry, in the state of Missouri, our current partners oftentimes come to us and ask for and advocate for the idea that they need better representation within those two critical areas. They need male teachers and they need teachers that identify as people of color because of representation within their own school systems. If we were hearing different things from partners in Kansas, I imagine that our focus would shift in order to be responsive to that. And I'll just name that that's an area of focus for us across the board, which is that we want to be responsive to what district partners are telling us that they need. And we've been able to be pretty effective in doing so in the state of Missouri to date. So the young, are, you, are you looking younger or are you looking for like high, or high school age or just all across the board? I, so right now, the way that it's currently set up is we would be certifying for elementary and middle school. Okay. And that's what we do in Missouri. We do early childhood as well. Okay. And we're opening SPED, which would be a possibility, I think, sometime in the future, uh, just not immediately as okay. we work to spool up that as a pilot program. Thank you. Of course. Uh, yes, I was wondering if you could just comment a little bit about, um, I know you have a lot of support for teachers built into your, your program where they have um, actual in-classroom experience and then one day a week, I think it is, mm -hmm. that they, uh, they get to reflect on that and, yep. and to, to work together. Yeah. Um, as well as the follow-on over, over the, um, during the year when, they, when they're teaching. Could you talk a little bit about that and um, maybe your opinion of uh, how useful that mentoring piece is for your the students or the teachers that are involved in that program? Absolutely. So I noted before that one of the things that we believe is critical to teacher success and retention long term is developing really strong habits from the very beginning of a teaching career. What I believe and what I've seen happen in my career and with my peers was oftentimes the first couple of years is a real struggle. There's not immediate mentorship. There's not always someone nearby to support you in your development. And as a result of that, you resort to habits that ultimately aren't going to be effective long term with kids. Um, giving kids candy, raising your voice, things like that. So what we know for sure is that seeing someone demonstrate good teaching practice in front of you day in, day out, every day, four days a week, for the duration of a school year is going to help you cement a good set of habits. In addition to having the leadership of that mentor teacher, who oftentimes then winds up being a peer as you get hired onto that teaching staff, residents also have the instructional coach from our team that visits them once a week. That instructional coach supports not only our resident, but also supports the mentor teacher in developing their coaching skills. And this is one of the ways that we sort of pitch the program to school districts, is to say that not only are you going to get a new person, a new staff member to hire, but also your existing and veteran staff member is going to receive development from our organization that we have really strong feedback around that we've been told is effective for helping them become strong coaches themselves or, or near peer coaches. And that allows uh, everyone in that situation to develop. That instructional coach then follows the resident not only through the residency year, 
but also through the first three years as teacher of record. So it's ongoing support, ongoing coaching. Now that's differentiated, of course. We don't continue to coach weekly for people who are in their first, second, or third year. But for residents that move into the graduate side, are certified teachers hired into positions, if they need additional coaching and support, they receive that from our program. The differentiation is based on performance as well as, from, as well as based on feedback from the partner about how they're doing. So if someone is struggling, they're gonna receive more coaching support from us. If someone is, is proving to be really successful, is kind of you know, flying, then they may receive uh, less frequent coaching support from us. But we believe that that coaching support afforded to not only the mentor and the resident, uh, but even at, at times, sort of a, a, a partnership is formed between our instructional coaches and other instructional coaches at the school, principals, instructional leaders, our instructional coaches take a lot of time and energy to invest in the relationships they have in the building, and our team does the same. We meet quarterly with the principals in the building to ensure that the program is working effectively. Of course. Seeing no more questions, a motion would be in order. Oh, perfect timing. <laughs> Sorry. We are way ahead. I did not realize that. Just, just to give him an introduction, this is Dr. Charles King. <laughs> We're, we're ready for a motion. Nice job. You did great. <laughs> okay. Have I? Thank you, Mr. Chair. It is moved that the Kansas State Board of Education approve the Kansas City Teacher Residency Program as an alternative elementary licensure pilot for elementary teaching. And is there a second to this motion? Betty Arnold seconds that motion. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor, please raise your hand. The... The clarification, uh, the motion is about elementary. We talked about middle school. Yeah, I, I mentioned it in passing. I believe our discussions to date have been focused exclusively on, on elementary. Okay, so this is just elementary. I'm just clarifying it. Thank you for that. Of course. Thank you for keeping us in order, Ben. <laughs> I don't do it very often. All in favor, please raise your hand. Looks to me like it's unanimous. We really appreciate, Doctor, your, your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> no, no problem. No, yeah, we're way we're way ahead of schedule. We will reconvene at two forty-five. Thank you all.
Members, please take your seats. See, you responded immediately. <laughs> so you get to follow instruction the whole way. And my microphone's live, so everybody in the world heard that. What? <laughs> Tell somebody who cares. <laughs> so it's, it's, we're so far ahead, we're going to adjust the uh, agenda because uh, me and the PPC is supposed to be virtual at 325, and so we'll have to wait for that. So we're going to move on to item number 16, and Rad's mm -hmm. going to explain the West Elk decisions situation. Thank you, Chairman Porter. So, you know, while there's plenty of other people in this agency that's been here longer than I have, uh, in my 14 years, we've never had anybody apply for charter status. So I thought I would just kind of, it might be, since we do have a little bit of time, and normally my job is to get you back on schedule, um, now that we take, have a few do minutes. Not take 25 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just thought I could briefly explain, you know, the situation with West Elk, but then how it just kind of fits into a, more of an overall picture. So what West Elk uh, is wanting to do is really start a, a virtual school, but they want to do it more innovative than what you would traditionally consider a virtual school, which is why they also wanted to seek a charter school status. But to start a virtual school, they already had to apply for that, which they already have. That was uh, the deadline for that was February 15th. So everything that they're wanting to do in their virtual program, they don't need to be a charter status in order to do. Uh, so when we met with them, um, I would uh, estimate the last time a district came to this board to seek charter school status. It was before virtual schools were really a thing. Charter schools are normally uh, an in-person environment where you want to do something different and innovative and you want to be waived from one or more regulations in or board regulations in order to go about accomplishing that go that goal. Well, West Elk didn't have they didn't want waived from anything. They had nothing that they that there was a regulation preventing them. So when we visited with them last week just to make sure then they also realized, well, if I am a charter school, there are charter, because that's an actual statute, there are things that they would have had to do under that that just quite, so they reached out to us and said, what we really want to do is kind of break the mold on what people think traditional virtual is. They want a heavy focus on um, individual plans of study. They want a deep focus on social emotional learning. They actually want to have more graduation requirements than the state board sets. They want to have advanced placement. They want to have four credits of the core courses, which is higher. Than, so they, they want to take virtual to the next level, but they can do that anyway because most School districts in the state have higher than 24 or 21 state board credits. So I just wanted to share with you, they, they are moving forward with their virtual program. They are interested in then folding that into redesign. Uh, but they just finally decided we don't think we need to see, seek the charter school status because that's not quite what they thought it was. So they... Uh, sent us the letter that you have uh, just to let you know that they plan on moving forward, but just not under the umbrella of charter school. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Other questions of Brad? 
Seeing none, thank you very much. Okay, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What are the, I, I guess I need to look, I was trying to find on page 47. What are the age, uh, is that high school? Is that high school? Or is that all grades or? Uh, they, they are looking through K through 12. Okay. Virtual. Okay, so they're looking for virtual even for the elementary. Yes. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. Janet. Uh, I was, I've been here long enough, as you well know. <laughs> I've been here longer than you. <laughs> I remember charter schools, and uh, you know, would you like to explain what they used to be and the reason why they did it, or you know, I could talk to that either way. I just think that everyone needs to know that, because there's no reason to have them, because they still have to meet the standards, I mean, yeah. for accreditation. Yeah, so, and I'm just going to go off memory, because it's been so long, and I, I wasn't even here the last time. But when charter schools initially began, I, I believe there was a grant and it was allowed up to so many and there was a little bit of money that you could apply for the grant in order to do it. But it still has to be the local school board that approves the charter school within their district. So it's not just anybody could come to this body and say, I mean, it, it had to still happen underneath the umbrella and the permission and the vote first of the local school board. Um, so today, there, there are no charter school grants. Um, there, again, so if a district wanted to start one, it would most likely be because they wanted to do something innovative and there was some regulation that was preventing them to do it, so it would have also come with, and here's what we would like this board to waive us from. Mm -hmm. Maybe a licensure, maybe uh, uh, hours or, or whatever, but, it's, um, but I think the last one that probably came to this board was in the 90s. Yes, I, I, I remember them, and, and the ones that were charter schools, Quit being charter schools when they didn't get any money because why should they be a charter school and they could still do what they were doing. So. And I think most of them found out, similar to the, the innovative schools, the, the legislation for innovative schools, there was, um, most of them found out that there were really, really were no regulations that were in our way. They just had to be more innovative about how they approached their systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's why I believe there just hasn't been any charter school request mm -hmm. for many years. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, thank you, Brad. Motion would be in order to approve the consent agenda. Ben makes the motion. Is there a second? Ann seconds the motion. All in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed, unanimous vote. And our next item of business is the legislative report. So we'll start with Craig and end with Ben and Dina. So the legislature is at turnaround. Uh, they have more or less completed the first half of their work. Bills theoretically had to pass the first house by the end of last week uh, if they wanted to continue for this session. But there are a number of ways bills can stay alive, and we'll talk about that just a little bit. Um, in fact, some will tell you no bill ever really dies. It can end up being amended into something later in the session. There are all kinds of ways that they pop back up. I just listed a few of them on the sheet for you. You have the full list of bills, which is a little shorter than it used to be because we have hit turnaround and there are some bills that probably you won't see again. So we pulled those off the list. Uh, but there are some included on this on the uh, tracking sheet that have not passed the first house yet, but uh, are still alive for a number of reasons. So a few just to highlight that I thought you might be interested in. House Bill 2039 is the one about requiring the civics exam for graduation. That passed the House, and so it will now move on to the Senate uh, after having been passed by the entire House. 
Uh, Senate Bill 13, I'm going to come back to in just a second. Senate Bill 235 is the bill uh, that requires schools to have an in-person option beginning March 26th and forevermore after that date. Um, that bill passed the Senate and is scheduled for a hearing on the House side in the K-12 Education Budget Committee tomorrow. Uh, so that was just added to that Senate's uh, schedule over the weekend, actually. Uh, and we'll be up for hearing there, and then they will work the bill sometime later and decide whether to move it to the floor of the House or not. So now I'll back up to Senate Bill 13. Passed the Senate, and it passed the House. It was amended in the House. We had not followed it real closely because prior to being amended in the House uh, late last week, school districts were not affected. The House amended school districts back into the bill. Uh, what it does is requires a great deal of work on behalf, behalf of county clerks as well as some other steps for municipalities, which now include school districts. The county clerk has to identify uh, what the bill defines as a revenue neutral tax rate for property taxes for all municipalities. The idea is when assessed valuations increase, even if you keep your mill rate flat, so if your mill rate for the district as a total was 51 mills last year and it's 51 mills again this year, if assessed valuation went up, you're still taxing people more. They're going to pay more taxes because of that valuation increase. So the idea behind this bill is you can't do that without explaining to people that that's exactly what's happening. Even though my mill rate's still 51 mills, I'm paying more taxes to this particular entity. So in order to accomplish that, the county clerk has to notify every district by June 15th of what their revenue neutral tax rate would be. Well, in order to do that, the county clerk has to know what the estimated assessed valuation is. That's a little earlier than they used to tell us. They used to tell us in early July. They were required to let districts and other municipalities know. Now they've got to tell them June 15th. The municipality, including the school districts now, has to tell the county clerk then by July 15th if they're going to exceed that amount. So by July 15th, school districts have to know if they're going to, what their mill rate's going to be for the coming year. Typically, they don't know that soon. They don't adopt their budgets until August. Uh, so this moves that clock up considerably. If they're going to exceed it, then the county clerk sends a notice to each individual taxpayer with how that will affect them individually. What will it do to your own tax levy? Uh, for each of the municipalities that are going to exceed the mill rate or the, the revenue neutral tax rate. So having cleared that July 15th time, timeline, then the municipality has to have a hearing no earlier than August 10th. That's not new for school districts except for the August 10th requirement. They have to have a, a hearing on their budget every year anyway. And they have to submit their budget to the county clerk by August 25th. Well, this bill leaves that requirement in statute, but also now says you have to have it, uh, you have to have your hearing no later than September 10th. Well, for a school district, you're not gonna have your hearing in September if you've already turned in your budget in August. So it really hasn't changed the publication, notice of hearing, and hearing dates for school districts since August 25th to turn in your budget still in place. The only change is you cannot have your hearing prior to August 10th. And for many districts, they would have their hearing at their first board meeting in August, which might have been before August 10th. So they may have to have a special meeting to have their budget hearing under this particular statute now, if it becomes statute. And I think that's the majority of the changes. I've probably left something out. Um, it, it creates some unique situations, particularly for school districts. Uh, if you had a bond election, uh, so 
Uh, we've had a few this year, Shawnee Mission, Lewisburg, some others. Your patrons have already voted and said, yes, raise my taxes to pay for this building. Now summertime rolls around and you're going to exceed your revenue net neutral tax rate because you had a bond election. Nevertheless, you've got to send out another notice to let everybody know that their taxes are going to increase, even though they already voted on it. For the first two, sending out all those notices, providing all the information is going to be quite a cost for some county clerks. For the first two years, the state covers that cost. After that, the municipalities involved have to pay for that expense to the county clerk's office. So if you're a school district and you passed a bond issue, you're now going to have to pay some of the cost to notify everybody again that you passed a bond issue and are going to raise taxes. Um, for any municipality, school district or otherwise, if you have a new industry open up in town, that's going to increase your valuation quite a bit. Your revenue neutral, you may exceed the revenue neutral tax rate because of that new industry, although the taxes for homeowners are going to decline. The overall tax rate went up, but you're going to be able to lower your, your mill rate and homeowners will actually pay less. But you've still got to send out a notice to tell them because the overall property tax rate went up. So there's, there are some unique little issues that will create some challenges um, for school districts as well as other municipalities. Since the bill was different when it passed the House than it was the Senate, it'll have to go back to the Senate where they'll vote either to concur or to put it into conference committee. If it goes to conference committee, then they'll have to work out the differences between the two versions of the bill. So that's, that's what we know at the moment about Senate Bill 13. Like I say, we had not really been following it real closely until the school districts were amended back in. We'll see what happens when it goes back to the Senate. A few other bills you may like to know about, although they have not passed either chamber yet, they're still alive. House Bill 2301 is the one that would require financial literacy for juniors and seniors. You'd have to have a course, they'd have to take it. Uh, that did not uh, pass out of the House Education Committee where it had been placed, but it was moved to the Appropriations Committee, and that keeps it alive. That is, quote, a blessed committee. So once it, any bill that touches that committee stays alive. So although House Ed did not work it, uh, it's still alive. They may not do anything with it, but the potential is there. 2154 is the bill that would allow cameras to be uh, placed on school bus stop arms by a vendor uh, to help slow down, kept, catch those people who pass buses illegally when they're trying to pick up kids. Uh, that's quite a danger. Some parts of the state uh, happens more often than others, but it happens everywhere, I think I can safely say. Um, the bill was passed out of the Judicial Committee on the House side, went to the House floor, never moved above the line, so it never got into position to be voted on by the entire House, but they also placed it in the Appropriations Committee, so it's still alive and could come back to the House floor for a vote. And then Senate Bill 173, earlier in the session, touched one of the blessed committees. Uh, that's the bill that uh, puts into statute a number of requirements for at-risk funds, most of which uh, the state board and school districts are already doing. It, uh, it requires the state board to post the evidence-based at-risk best practices, which you've already started doing. It requires um, school districts to transfer all the weighting they receive for at-risk and high-density at-risk into the at-risk fund. Most districts spend more than they receive anyway, so that shouldn't be a big issue. Um, and it does renew the high-density at-risk weighting. Um, the bill was never worked on the Senate floor, but as I said, it's, it was blessed earlier, so it's still alive. And then on the second page, House Bill 2119 uh, passed K-12 Education Budget Committee twice. First time just as House Bill 2119 uh, was moved out, then sent back to committee, and they amended a number of things in there, which is what I have listed on that, on that page. And so actually now it's sub for House Bill 2119. 
And I went ahead and gave you the list of all the items that are in there because it's kind of lengthy and a little bit confusing. The original 2119 created the savings accounts for students and their parents that can be used to pay private school tuition. To that then, when it came back to committee, uh, they added 2067 that requires school districts to allocate their resources so that you're ensuring all your students will meet the Rose standards. Um, I think many school districts would tell you they try to do that anyway. 2068 expands the tax credit for low-income students scholarship act. I think we talked about that. Uh, that was passed out of committee. When 2119 came back, they put it back in. Uh, it expands it so that any student in any public school who qualifies for free or reduced meals would be eligible for a scholarship to one of the qualifying private schools. Uh, currently, it's free meals only, and you have to be in one of the 100 lowest performing public elementary schools. So this opens it up to every school in the state. Uh, 2396 and 2397 are just the appropriations bills. That's what's funding K-12 education for the next two years. They amended that into this bill. So this is now an appropriations bill as well as a policy bill. Remote learning, a, a new funding formula essentially was created for students who are remote learners. If a student is a remote learner for more than 40 hours in any year or more than 240 hours in a year in which a disaster emergency is declared, they become a remote learner for funding purposes, which means rather than funding them at the base, you fund them at $5,000 for a full-time student. And only full-time remote learners are funded at, uh, at any rate. They no longer qualify for any weightings, just like a virtual student. So the way the, the system would work, obviously you don't know going into the year if a student's gonna qualify as a remote learner or not. You don't, you don't necessarily know that that's the way they're going to to learn some, what's going to happen as the school year goes on. So September 20th, as a school district, you're gonna turn the student in uh, just like you would every other student. You're gonna count them as a regular student with all the weightings and so forth. Then at the end of the year, the school district will inform KSDE, here's the students that were remote learners. And we'll make the adjustments to their funding at that time and probably because it's the end of the year, need to reduce funding the following year. Uh, the, the switching them to remote learning would have the impact of reducing funding. And how much depends on which weightings they qualified for. Uh, the, the more weightings they qualified for, the more you would reduce their funding per student. So that's the, the per student section of it. There's another piece that says as a school district, you cannot put your schools into remote learning, your entire school, for more than 240 hours when a, a, a disaster emergency is declared. If that disaster emergency lasts longer than that, you, you don't have an option. You cannot continue remote learning. It, uh, no change in funding status, just you can't do it, period. And the district has to have permission of the State Board of Education to do it in the first place. So they would need to apply to you before they actually went into remote learning. So that is also now a piece of substitute for House Bill 2119. Then they directed a few ways to spend ESSER funds, primarily for the State Department of Ed. Um, we would be directed to spend a part of our ESSER funds, $5 million for the school safety grants, which we had for two years. They weren't funded for this year. So they would like to see us uh, spend ESSER money for that to school districts. $3.9 million for the mental health initiative program. Uh, mental health services are specifically listed in ESSER funds uh, as a way you can spend money, but like the rest of, of ESSER money, you're gonna have to prove that it's related to COVID. It can't just be for any mental health services. It's gotta be needed because of what's transpired with COVID. Um, $466,000 to pay for phase three of the state school for the deaf language assessment program. 
and $100,000 for communities and schools. That was all directed for KSDE to, to sp spend our ESSER money for those programs. Um, they were informed because the question was specifically asked uh, that the state board took action in February and directed us how to spend the ESSER II set-aside money. Uh, so they already know that that state board directed how that money should be spent. And then the final thing they did, they recommended, and they were careful to use the word recommend, that school districts uh, spend, uh, pay $500 per teacher as a stipend uh, to their staff, which the Office of Management and Budget at the federal level has said you cannot pay stipends to individuals with ESSER funds. You can pay salaries. If they had to do extra duties, you could pay a supplemental salary. But again, you've got to be able to indicate that it was necessary due to COVID. Uh, and I think, and this is just my opinion now, I think they were careful to use the word recommend because somebody probably legislative research made it clear to them they can't direct school districts how to spend their ESSER funds. Uh, this, the federal law is pretty clear on that. State board can't direct it. The legislature can't direct it. With that, Mr. Chairman, I would stand for questions. Not can, many bills there, but some of them are kind of can they messy. Direct, can they direct us how to spend the funds? Um, I could give you an opinion, but I don't know what the federal folks would say, but I would, my opinion would be no. That would be my opinion also. Janet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the virtual schools. We have districts I know I have some in my district that have virtual schools and have had them for years. Mm -hmm. Baser Linwood, I believe, is the oldest one in the state. Uh, and I understand other districts, or at least one district I've heard of, is going to open a virtual school next year. So does this impact the same thing? <coughs> Go for these ones that have been in existence forever? The, are you referring to the remote learning? And yes. you can't, okay. I'm talking the, about a virtual school, you know? Baser Linwood virtual school. <laughs> So remote learning and virtual schools are different. Okay. Virtual schools, in fact, the, the sponsor of this amendment uh, would rather in, wants to encourage virtual schools rather than re doesn't want remote learning. Remote learning is uh, when you have to send the students home like we have this year. We haven't had remote learning until this year. That's when you can't hold school because of, in this case, a pandemic. And so you, you allow students to do their work at home. Your teachers interact with them, uh, some cases over video, some cases by sending work home. It's not a separate educational system like virtual learning okay. can be. So that would not impact them. Well then, so in other words, if uh, they close school for snow. This would take away the option to provide remote learning. You'd be okay as long as you used it less than 40 hours over the course of the year. Tornadoes? Uh, that's a good question, depending on when the tornado hit. If it came early in the year and there were enough hours left in the year, you could not go to, re to remote learning to offset the time that you were losing. You'd have to make up the time some other way. Okay. Thank you. My interpretation of the bill. Thank you. Any other questions for Craig? Ben and Dina, you're on. Um, I, I think one of the important things is all, for House Sub 2119, it's, it's a huge bill, but all those individual bills in it have also been blessed individually uh, as well. So everything in there, if they decide that they have to break up 2119, everything within it is still alive uh, as well. I was just double checking that my notes were correct on that. Yeah, good point. Uh, in terms of that. That's just an important point. I don't, uh, you did a really good job covering it, as always. I don't know that I really have anything to add info-wise. Um, in terms of that, I don't know, Dina, if there's anything with adding. I've enjoyed the extra long weekend with them going home. That was wonderful. <laughs> Is now we need, like, for us to do a report? I, um, <clears throat> have and been have been writing and writing sometimes it's been 
um, kind of at the last minute that we find out a bill is, is not only was it just written, but uh, it's being heard the, the next day. And they have guidelines that you're supposed to have the bill, uh, the testimony in 24 hours prior to the hearing. Sometimes they didn't give you 24 hours notice. So generally they were understanding that you couldn't have gotten it in at that time, but we have written for just about all of the bills except for those that uh, we didn't know were going to affect us, uh, like Senate Bill 13, for example. It was an, uh, the ex all exemptions were removed on the floor, so that removed uh, the school district and automatically and so we uh, had that issue just sort of pop up and um, we have written testimony for 62 which is a vision um, a change in the way that vision screenings would be done, not a huge change, but one that is connected to what, what currently should be done, being done. And um, also um, Senate Bill 235, so, and we have written neutral on the uh, vision screening because it wasn't something we discussed as a group. So, um, and 235, because it gets into uh, the responsibility of school boards, we oppose that. Um, that legislation and I don't know what everybody else thinks but I would not be surprised to see 2119 since it will be placed back in the committee to have that bill added to 2119 as well since it actually does have a component that deals kind of with that issue of in-person, um, full-time um, education. So we're, so far I've been basically online. I think Ben's maybe done some, he's done more specific phone calls to individuals that uh, he's had a relationship with and ones that I know um, are pro-education and uh, I can't say that about all of them that I have in my district so uh, that will look at public education in, in, a pot, in the manner that we've been focusing on. So um, I've let Ben kind of roll with that because a lot of those people live in his district. And uh, anyway, we may well with 2119, I'll just branch out and suggest that all of you might pull up that bill and read it, <laughs> and uh, in it's the new version of it, and contact the 
legislators that you feel should know what you think um, about the bill. So there's a, it's got so many moving parts that uh, any lots of parts of it are are problematic. So uh, you could probably pick and choose the things that you have most concerned about, or if you have issues with the entire bill, but I'd urge you to have reasons why you oppose it. Yeah. Or um, support it, for that matter. I'm not going to tell you you can't call if you support some part of it, but at any rate, um, it's been an interesting year and will continue to be. And um, just help us roll with the punches, I guess. Yeah. Um, I will add, uh, and I, I can't remember the bill number, the ACT bill. Uh -huh. It was on the, I can't remember if they passed over it on the floor. Is it still in the Senate or is it dead or is it past the Senate over in the House? Senate Bill 63, I believe is the right number, and I believe it passed the Senate. Yeah, I thought it was. Um, and it provided, um, yeah. in terms of that, that's another bill that, I mean, it's not a big one, but it is, yes. it's still going. It, it opens, Senate Bill 63 opens the ACT, the work keys, and the pre-ACT to private school students, as well as public school students uh, at state cost. And it does not at this point cost, cost any additional funds, correct? Uh, as far not, as we know. Not until we renegotiate. And that is that is ongoing at the moment. The contract with ACT expires at the end of this year, uh, so it's being renegotiated. And it included I know previously it had been talked about it would be accredited private schools. This bill is all private students, whether it's accredited or non-accredited, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, I thought there was a workaround, and that's weeds, and you can try to educate me because I got lost in that conversation <laughs> on the Senate floor, um, the, the nuances of that, of that piece. Um, I just forgot my other point. This is why I should write down when I have the thoughts. I uh, had the ACT and there was a second thought. That gets worse with age, man. <laughs> uh, it's it's kind of squirrel brain, I think. But um, for those that I have reached out to, to some of you to, to kind of fill you in on some things going on, because you have some schools that are directly impacted by some of the actions. Um, and so I appreciate appreciate that. I will say when, when a lot of things are on the floor, like the, the um, civics bill was on the House floor, my phone blew up from legislators on the floor saying, what is this thing <laughs> and what does it do? Um, and so during that whole debate, yes, I was in my office at my other job, my normal job, and uh, I had it on, but I didn't get to listen to a lot of the floor debate because I was on the phone uh, pretty much the entire time. So that's I've been more of the calling, visiting, one-on-one, -on -one, answering questions um, in terms of that that aspect. So it's it's been a whirlwind. In case you haven't, most of the bills are around privatizing or sending more money to private schools. That's a big goal, as well as um, getting in our business, uh, telling us what graduation credits and what tests we should require. Those are kind of the general themes. There are some good bills. The stop arm bill got blessed. I was very happy with that. There are some good bills out there that we do want to see across the finish line. We've been very supportive of, uh, as well as making sure we get that dyslexia coordinator through there. It got through the Senate part. It got, uh, well, it made it through the Ed Committee as a recommendation, so uh, that's moving forward with that. So I don't have anything else to add. I want to follow up. Uh, it appears to me that there are at least three, this is to all of us, this appears to me that there are at least three activities going on that directly impact our authority to function. Uh, in my view, we are responsible for graduation requirements. Uh, and so the uh, civics bill that, that 
that is a graduation requirement. I'm not talking about the merits. I'm talking about the authority to make decisions. In my view, that is our responsibility, not the legislator's responsibility. The financial literacy thing has come up for the last 15 or so years. Uh, and there are school districts that have that course. And there are school districts that teach those concepts other ways. And that is a direct involvement in our business because we have, we have the standards. And we expect school districts to teach those standards. And some of them have chosen to do it, exactly what the bill says. In the school that I came from, we did it as a senior requirement. So we did that 15 years ago. But other school districts are doing other things. And then uh, the uh, instructions on how to spend ESSER funds which we believe is the sole responsibility of the Department of Education. To that end, we need to have a discussion about our reaction. And I have asked Mark, not now, but because we don't need to, we do not need to, we do not need to act prematurely. But if there, if we in fact, uh, there are efforts, successful efforts to try to, to, Serve our responsibilities, we need to know what our options are. So I've asked Mark uh, to, uh, to research that and be able to report that back to us at the appropriate time. And if none of these things come to fruition, the appropriate time is not this year. If some of these things do come to fruition, the appropriate time for us to have that discussion, I have in no way committed the board to anything except to have a discussion because that will be our decision, not my decision. So I just wanted to bring you up to date on that, on that issue. Uh, I think it's important, and if we're going to continue to lead the world to success of each student, we need to be able to make the decisions and keep consistent with our vision instead of these diversions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Do we have, uh, are we ready for the, oh, I believe it's item 15. Hello, Jennifer. We can't hear you. There we go. Hello. Good afternoon. Very good. The, the, uh, the floor is yours. Will you explain these two cases to us, please? Sure. Let me bring that screen back up. Um, so both of these um, are a case where we're recommending uh, public censure. So that's just on their license. Um, and they're just, they're both good examples of where someone uh, kind of owned the mistake that they made and has made amends and working towards progress. The second one in particular, I will say we were all moved because this applicant went, you know, things happen. And a lot of times um, people just kind of make it right and then move on and try to leave that part of them behind. And she really um, instead owned it and it changed her whole world. She kind of helped kids. She used it to, to reach out to her students and in a different way, not telling them her personal experiences, but really opening the conversation and doing some really powerful work um, around that. So in both of these, um, we felt like public censure was sufficient. Okay. Are there any questions of any board members? Anne. Yes. Um, I move that the Kansas State Board of Education issue a professional teaching license with public censure to licensee 19 PPC 34 and applicant 20 PPC 11. Is there a second to that motion? Dina seconds that motion. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries <coughs> unanimously. I, I'm terribly sorry, Jennifer, that we didn't uh, take more time to give you the opportunity to visit with us more, but looks like we've finished that process. All right, no, it's just fine. Thank you much. Now, 
apologize to my colleagues for being this far ahead. At this point, uh, are there any additions to travel? Ben. I can remember the list. I gave my list to Peggy. I have an ESDAC meeting on the 24th. Um, With soups, with possible mileage, but salary for sure. Uh, the K toy banquets or K toy celebrations that weekend, which were not on mine. And then I have a volunteer commission meeting on April 6th, which is virtual, so salary only. Okay, all members who are planning on participating in K toy that have not already turned that in, please raise your hand. And so Peggy can get it. That's just virtual, the links. Okay. Anything else, Eugene? Yes, I have uh, superintendent council meetings um, in Oakley on Tuesday, April 6th, and on Wednesday in Sublette, um, April 7th for salary and mileage. And then I'm also attending a Zoom um, for the professional um, standards board on micro uh, committee. I don't know if I need to mention that one. Is it the same day as your administrative migrant? Yeah, it is. Okay, that's all. Do you have anything else? Jim, is there anybody else doing the rural education summit through K-State? Because I have to register you for that competition. Yeah, register me. Jim? I've got a message for April 5th for Randy visiting Wichita. Joining him. Do you need it? I thought that's the presentation. Anything else? Motion would be in order to approve or travel. Jim McNeese, seconded by. Somebody, Betty. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand. All opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Committee reports. Let's start with communications. Melanie and Jim. Well, we've got our postcards that started, and they're going out. Melanie's done a great job, and so has Denise, as always. And uh, we've had three of them go out, and we're planning more. Appreciate that good work. Uh, policy committee, and then followed by school mental health, uh, both with both with Jean. The policy committee uh, met today and will be meeting next month to um, discuss possible change to the um, how to withdraw an item from the consent agenda the paragraph and the policy that talks about that and to present uh, some new ideas. Um, and on the School Mental Health Advisory Committee, is that the one you had also mentioned? Yes. Okay. Um, we also had a meeting on the 25th of February, um, and a, there's a board report in your package for that. But... but uh, some of the things I would like to mention is that April is Child Abuse Prevention Month and that child abuse reports have been rising according to the information that we had received. And there was also a concern about those students that had not re-enrolled um, this year that were on our rolls last year. Um, so there are some trainings being developed pertaining to child abuse and neglect and uh, hopefully that That'll help teachers and districts uh, deal with those things in a, in a, in a more effective way. Um, we also had Jane Groff discuss the career planning and digital citizenship resources that she had located in a Wisconsin school district. And those uh, there's links to those in, in the board report. Um, 
it was really interesting the way they did that, and they did start did digital citizenship uh, um, training for students at, at the third grade level, which was really younger than I would have suspected, but um, very effective in, in teaching young children what's uh, safe on the internet and what isn't. So um, I would encourage you to take a look at those. Um, the website that she found that the school district uses would, had really great explanations of all of that. It was all grade banded, there was curriculum in there, and it was uh, based on information from commonsense.org. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other committee reports? Michelle? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just talked to Mark, and he is putting all the vaping that we had last week. He's putting all that, all those notes together, and you'll have that very soon. And I'll send that to Peggy for the okay. vaping task force. Thank you. We have a lot of updates on that. So. Thank you very much. Anything else? If not, board attorney's report. I sent out an email summary, uh, but I'd like to cover some of the highlights of the next steps following receipt of the final order that was issued by the Civil Service Board in the matter of the appeal uh, related to an, uh, an employee. And I'm not going to get into the, any strategy issues or um, disclosure of, of things that uh, you know we'll be discussing in, uh, later this week with John Harding and his team, but um, I think it's important to to share with you kind of what's involved in the uh, next steps uh, should he decide to, to uh, want to appeal that. Uh, the findings of the Civil Service Board are highlighted in the email with regard to uh, uh, the, uh, the finding that the decision of the uh, appointing authority, which is the School for the Blind, was unreasonable and was reversed. The Civil Service Board did find that the employee violated the Civil Service Act based on his conduct and essentially uh, reversed the suspension, or excuse me, the termination and uh, renamed it a, um, a suspension for 30 days um, and reimposed or reinstated the employee to the position. Uh, neither party was assessed costs or, or fees in, in the case. And so um, there's a couple steps that um, are provided for and rest, request reconsideration uh, of the uh, order of the uh, Civil Service Board. We can um, uh, request the, uh, that the written order be issued um, and that the, um, the Civil Service Board uh, take a different outcome. However, in this case, it was unanimous from those board members, so that uh, even though that may be one of the steps, it's probably unlikely to be as successful. Uh, the appeal of the decision of the board then under the judicial review of agency action can be uh, taken to the district court. And um, so the Civil Service Board is the administrative remedy of the either the agency or the employee. Um, in this case, the School for the Blind, which is the appointing agency or the employee. They go through that process. They exhaust their administrative remedies. And then if either party is unsatisfied with the outcome uh, of the board, then the, um, the um, party that wants to appeal can appeal to the District Court of Shawnee County where the uh, order was issued. Uh, we would then uh, request a record or a transcript of the two and a half day proceeding um, before the board, which which was a trial where witnesses were put on and cross examined and evidence was was uh, presented, and the petition then can be filed with the agency to stay the final order of the board. So basically freezing the status quo so that um, during the pendency of the agents, the uh, appeal to the district court, there wouldn't be any reinstatement. It would just be uh, the status quo uh, and prevent reinstatement until the outcome of the uh, district court. The legal basis for the district court to change the outcome of the final order of the board uh, is set out in statute 
and there are eight different standards that are that are applied, and they're pretty lengthy. Um, not all of which would apply. Uh, for example, if you're taking the position that the that the board was not legally constituted, there are several uh, there are several things. Um, there are several um, available standards of review for the district court. For example, also if you had a statute that applied that you believed was unconstitutional. But I'll, I'll cover those that might possibly apply in this case, that the agency has not decided an issue requir requiring resolution, that the agency has erroneously interpreted or applied the law, uh, that the agency action is based on a determination of fact made or implied by the agency that is not supported to the appropriate standard uh, supported by the appropriate standard of proof by evidence that is substantial when viewed in light of the record as a whole, which includes the agency record for, for judicial review, supplemented by any additional evidence received by the court under the act, or that the agency uh, action is unreasonable, arbitrary, or capricious, which essentially means that they took action that didn't match the evidence presented in the underlying appeal. Uh, a couple of themes that are involved in the petition for judicial review, uh, the district court provides deference to a board's decision, except unless it's a um, interpretation of law. So the court is the ultimate uh, decider of the law, so they can, they they look at it, that that uh, determination or interpretation of law in a de novo review, but otherwise the district court will look at the record and give some sense of deference to the board's decision and their and their rationale. The burden of proof is on the party appealing the decision, and the district court reviews the the record or the transcript and all of the evidence presented. And so I think it's important to, uh, and I'll elaborate on it in a minute, but um, you don't not like a regular civil lawsuit where you take new evidence, where you might go take depositions, where you engage in discovery. You're making your arguments in print, using the record on the underlying proceeding, and making your arguments based on what was presented. So in the administrative process, you need to put on evidence, put on your witnesses. You don't know what the outcome's going to be, so if you eventually are not satisfied, you have to refer back to the record that was created, and so that's why you really have to take it uh, and look at it in a, in a comprehensive way, thinking that in the event you have to appeal it, you want, you want a complete um, a record and you want all the evidence to be submitted. Um, the district court may not ignore contrary evidence, so if it looks like you know, it wasn't a balanced consideration, um, then the district court has to look at and justify its decision to either uphold the underlying decision or to, um, uh, to uh, reverse it, but must look at uh, mitigating and enhancing circumstances, and that the court considers the, does consider the concept of harmless error. So the court can say, well, this, I, I agree with your appeal, I, you know, that, that was done incorrectly, but it doesn't change the outcome of the decision. So that's a legal concept that the district court has. So not only is this legal, this next process, step in the process important to um, the School for the Blind and making a determination as to whether or not they want to take this to the next level, um, it's important to talk about those concepts because the same procedure is what this board would is does follow when it goes through the pro professional practices uh, commission. So it delegates the fact finding and the evidence to the professional practices commission. The PPC makes recommendations to the board, and the board decides based on the the recommendations either to follow, to uh, reject or to modify the outcome, but the decisions of this board um, must be based on the evidence, and, the, and so when, the, when it's presented to you by the PPC uh, committee and put in writing, they consider both the aggravating and the mit mitigating factors, so that's why it's good to have the discussion at the board table about both the pluses and the minuses that support the decision, and um, this board has not had any uh, licensed uh, teachers appeal to the district court in 
quite a few years, probably seven years approximately, but um, you know, eight or nine years ago, we've had several cases that came before the state board. The board made decisions that impaired or put, uh, imposed discipline on the licensed uh, professional. They were not satisfied with that. They went to the district court. The district court made findings that were supportive of the board. And in fact, those, those uh, professionals then appealed to the Kansas Court of Appeals. So uh, we've had a number of, of um, uh, legal appeals in the distant uh, past, but not in the most recent. But that's, that's why we look at uh, and create the initial order that is, is presented to you, that when you make the finding that you are, you're adopting the, the findings of fact and the conclusions that are in the documents that are submitted to the board for review. So that in the event that, that um, you know, it's unlikely, for example, in the two cases you, you decided today related to censure, but if, you, uh, if your discipline was uh, severe enough to revoke a license, then that, that uh, licensee might uh, want to appeal to the district court. I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Any questions of Mark? Anne? Well, two. One is, has um, the school expressed an opinion about if they think we should proceed? And if we did, what do you think our chances of success would be? Um, I, I'm, would, I'll confer with the, the uh, board chair. I think that in, to discuss my opinions about that should be an executive session. I'm just talking about procedure. Um, you know, the commissioner or the, or you all may have a different opinion about whether or not they need your, um, I, I think they need, they need to keep you advised and they need to uh, seek your input. But since they're a separate state agency, even though they answer to the board and they present most of their, 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 um, you know, most of their policy decisions for your, uh, the decision, uh, I, I don't think that they have to get your approval as to whether or not they proceed. I'm certain that, that John Harding will keep you through my, he'll instruct me to, to keep you updated as to what he's recommending, but it's not something that would have to come to a formal board vote. Anything else? Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Next item is a request for future agenda items based on previous conversation earlier today under the legislative report. I would like for us to have a report on what schools, how schools are implementing our standards on financial literacy so that uh, whenever that information comes before us, we can answer questions like that. And I would hope that we can arrange to have that next month. Any other future agenda items? Betty. Um, yes, I would like, and, and I don't have an end date, but a presentation on student transportation. One of the things that's kind of come up within my district is that uh, there are a lot of grandparents who are now parenting um, students, um, and they don't drive, and, and so there are challenges with getting their elementary age uh, students that's in their care to school, and I'd like to look at uh, a way that, um, or rather how that's set up. The, the, the second thing, um, I love the document Navigating Next. I mean, it, I've read it a couple of times, really, I have, and I would love a presentation since Navigating Next is a reality of how that was put together and and how the concerns were were um, highlighted in that. I think it would be a great opportunity for the public to see a lot of the positive things that are being done. And that concludes both my request. Okay. Any more? Adina. Thank you. Um, I get a number of education journals and equity seems to be a big issue um, in those journals. And I belong to the Delta Kappa Gamma locally, and we recently 
had a, a program on equity councils, and um, I thought it would be good probably for this body to hear what districts are doing to promote equity in their districts and uh, doesn't have to be done tomorrow but I think it would be good for us to um, to hear about that and I know that was one of the things that uh, the commissioner mentioned today as well so maybe what, if we knew more about what districts already are doing, um, we wouldn't tell them to do, to re, we wouldn't be reinventing wheels. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, want, I had talked to Dr. Watson about possibly bringing a student from the Blue Valley area. He has, uh, He's been running his own business since fifth grade, and he's now a sophomore. And he, he has his own business. I mean, it's a landscaping business. He can do everything from putting in um, your sprinkler systems to mowing your lawn. He, he works. When he's not in school, he's working 24-7. I mean, he works. He takes a small break in the summertime and gets away with his family. But he's been doing this since fifth grade, and I think it would be great to have something like that to show, um, have him do a, some type of a little, um, you know, I don't know, a little this uh, like a presentation for us just to show show what can be done by students when they <laughs> think outside the box <laughs> yeah i think that's a that's an excellent thing that we need to see but there are also others across the state that are so perhaps we can yeah he talked about other reach out to that. other school reach out across the state and maybe have a have a group come in yes. and talk about because they're all going to be different right, uh, right. about because we have some we have some kids doing some absolutely tremendous amazing things and it's, it's, it's always nice to hear those success stories yeah. and realize that we'll be working for them someday. Yeah. Bring in a group. That would be great. Okay. Any other agenda items? Let me remind you that the virtual regional banquets for KTOY is going to be March the 27th and 28th. Normally, we visit the School for the Deaf and Blind in April. Because of some conflicts, we're going to be doing that this year on Wednesday, May the 12th. Uh, normally, under a committee reports, there would have been an ESSER report today, but we're going to spend a lot of time on that tomorrow. So that will be covered tomorrow. We'll discuss the possibility uh, of, uh, at that point, we'll discuss the possibility of uh, giving more time to our private schools, and perhaps that would require a virtual, relatively short, special meeting later in April to do that uh, and I have nothing else and I would like for everybody to look at the time <laughs> and we will be in recess until nine o'clock in the morning